Hey guys, before we begin, I need to make some things clear. In today's episode, I'm going to read out the entire Star Wars Jewel of the Fates script. I need to make something clear. This is my first time doing a full read through. I've never done anything like this before. The reason I'm doing it is because I've had a look at the script and I got really excited and I kind of just wanted to do it for fun. Again, I should point out I'm not a professional. I'm probably going to make a ton of mistakes. I've never done this before. I don't, this is going to take me a while, so don't expect any professional Stephen Fry level read through. This is just a 21 year old kid in his room reading the scripts over a microphone. So, but yeah, I hope you enjoy. Welcome to Star Wars Jewel of the Fates. Star Wars Episode 9 by Derek Connolly and Colin Trevorrow, based on the characters created by George Lucas. Here we go. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. Episode 9, Drill of the Fates. The iron grip of the First Order has spread to the furthest reaches of the galaxy. Only a few scattered planets remain unoccupied. Traitorous acts are punishable by death. Determined to suffocate a growing unrest, Supreme Leader Kylo Ren has silenced all communication between neighbouring systems. Led by General Leia Organa, the Resistance has planned a secret mission to prevent their annihilation and forge a path to freedom. Space. A rich tapestry of stars reaching beyond all we know. Two sharp points of a space station enclose the sides of a frame as we drift backwards into the glowing rectangular entrance of a docking bay. A first order transport touches down. A wide platform descends revealing a variety of droids. A graphite BB unit carefully splits off from the group. The BB unit swerves to avoid a brutish labour droid, scraping the BB's spherical side against the wall. His head tilts down, checking a scuff in his paint, revealing orange beneath. It's BB-8, deep undercover. He lets out a familiar uh-oh and rotates the orange scuff beneath his head. A comm device blinks in a cramped room stacked with recycled Imperial gear. Rose Tico, adventure-worn and battle-ready, grabs it with gloved hands. BB-8, you in, she says. BB-8 beats affirmatively. Rose looks up through the broken roof at the orbital ring in the sky above. Star destroyers protrude from it like spikes on a punk bracelet. Rose continues, I need eyes on the checkpoint. BB-8 plugs into a scomp terminal, anxious and tense. Out the window, we see the glowing Kuat moon. Some crestling its horizon. The surveillance den. A hollow monitor grid lights up, blurred and scrambled. Rose straps electro goggles over her cracked leather flight helmet. Attaboy, she says. The images unscramble, revealing a security checkpoint. The HUD zooms in on an approaching dropship. Here they come, she says. Back to the QAP moon. The dropship touches down in a canyon of white and blue sedimentary rock, kicking up a storm of silver sand. The stormtroopers shield their eyes as the craft splits out a new batch of migrant workers from all corners of the galaxy. Aliens and humans submit into the First Order in exchange for food and safety. Stormtroopers funnel the migrants towards a weapons detector. We notice Finn is disguised in rags among them. Finn reaches out. Checkpoint. Keep your head down. A robed human nods, face hidden under dusty headwear. A bowl neck quickly forms. The ragged aliens bark at each other in a dozen languages. A beast like drove in, shoves Finn. Finn. Whoa, hey, no trouble here. The drove in grabs Finn's neck with a single hand and lifts him up, teeth bared. Finn. Trouble, trouble. The robed human steps between them, Poe Dameron. Easy pal, he says. Poe pulls a dry three-eyed pecto fish from a leather pouch beneath his robe. Here, I couldn't finish it, he says. The drovian eyes the fish, drops Finn, and eats. We notice Poe's hand on a concealed blaster beneath his robe. Finn regains his footing, clenching his neck. Thanks, he says. Poe shoots him a tense look. They move towards the scanner. Finn, how will we know if bb 8s hacked the mainframe? The weapon scanner alarms. Stormtroopers pull a mangy Gotel out of the group. He pleads, pointing desperately to his metallic horns. The stormtroopers fire on him. We'll know, Poe says. 
Poe and Finn step into the weapon scanner. Just as they enter, the machine shudders and clicks off. We lost power. Hold the line, the stormtrooper says. Stormtroopers step in front of the scanner, blast the smoke in. Finn and Poe eye each other, tense. Back to the queue at Orbital Ring. BB-8 scomp, links, stutters and spins. A stormtrooper drops a crate of spanners nearby. BB-8 startles as they clatter across the floor. He sweats. Back to the checkpoint. The stormtrooper smacks the console. It powers up again with our armed infiltrators standing inside it. No alarm. Go on guys, get moving, the stormtrooper says. Poe and Finn exhale, still alive. Poe and Finn pass through the border wall to reveal a vast migrant settlement. Modular housing painted with colourful symbols from each worker's home world. A vibrant melting pot. The orbital ring looms above, connected to the planet's surface by a massive power shaft plunged directly into the core. It glows blue, with a ship fueling energy mined here. Poe locks eyes with Biss Cover, a furry alien watching from a machine shop. Biss taps his cheek. That's our guy, Poe says. A big-cheeked, hairless alien baby bounces in a hanging sea cow's stomach while Biss's partner, Dal Cover, brushes an unappetizing roast with melted fat. Rose emerges from behind a beaded curtain in the back. You said two days. I've been here two weeks, she says. This place doesn't seem that bad, Finn remarks. Rose turns around. Good people, terrible food. Rose rolls a canvas map onto the table. This is our access point, she says. She drops a hollow chip. It projects the orbital ring and the power shaft plunging from it into the moon's core. This power shaft delivers raw ore to the orbital ring. A detonation directly into the energy stream here will cause a chain reaction. A blinking holographic light shoots up into the orbital ring, causing a series of explosions around the entire structure. And take the whole thing down, Poe says. Finn looks up through the broken roof of the orbital ring above. A dozen Star Destroyers fueling up. Along with their new fleet, Finn says. How do we know if they haven't detected BB-8 signature, Poe asks. The alien baby starts to cry. Rose picks up a rattle and shakes it. There's a lot we don't know. That's why I voted for the other plan, Poe says. This is when we second guess the plan right now, isn't it? Finn says. Rose sticks a finger into the alien baby's mouth. We can take the enemy's fuel source and be light years away before they know what hit them, but we have to move now, Rose says. Pin and Foe regard this odd moment. Rose really has been down here a while. Okay, let's blow this thing up and go home, says Poe. Poe, Finn and Rose move past migrant workers towards a massive power shelf base extending to the sky. The Tuscan follows them in the deep background. BB-8, don't worry I'm alive. Unlock the power shaft doors and let's get ready with that shuttle, says Poe. BB-8 detaches his scomp link and speeds down the corridor. Going back to the others, a trio of space grey mech troopers guard the door. Poe makes short work of the first mech trooper, knocking him unconscious. Finn and Rose quietly take down the other two with electric shock prods. Poe unlatches a device from the mech trooper's belt and throws it to Finn. He scans it on the wall. A massive cylinder of particle energy rushes upwards. Finn, Poe and Rose approach it and gaze up, dwarfed. We'll have 20 seconds before detonation, give or take, Poe says. Give or take how long, Rose asks. Poe hands out three flying thermal detonators. Nice and easy, just like pitching Pilmetto stick, Poe remarks. We didn't have that, Poe activates his charge. Oh, we're going now, Finn says. Poe underhands tosses his charge into the stream, where it rockets upwards in the particle flow. Rose throws hers. Finn chucks his like a live grenade and runs. Poe takes out his comm. BB-8, bombs are away. We'll meet you at the relay point. BB-8 rolls into the droid slot of a tiny maintenance shuttle, old and forgotten. Our heroes exit through the maintenance door to find themselves face to face with a platoon of stormtroopers and mech troopers. Drop your weapons, a stormtrooper says. Migrant workers crane their necks from the village. The masked Tuscan is among them. Poe eyes the orbital ring, anticipating the explosion. Distraction in three, two, one, now. Poe dives. Rolls, head covered, but nothing happens. A First Order officer rushes to alert Silly Admiral Vaughn and screen graphics show a contained blast in the power shaft. 
Blast shields have contained the explosion, Admiral. All systems stable, the officer says. Von looks down at the glowing Kirk moon and scoffs. Their outdated tactics are pitiful. Rose and Finn look up at the orbital ring, fully intact. Any second now, Poe says. Suddenly, a high-pitched wail spins them around. The hooded Tuscan steps forward. Blades of blue light flash from its gloved hands. It's holding a dual blue lightsaber. The Tuscan takes down everything in its path. Finn, Rose and Poe, duck and fire away until they are surrounded by bodies. Blasters smoke in. The Tuscan's mask hits the ground. It's Rey. Not the girl we last saw, a grown woman, powerful and strong. Finn says, what are you doing here? Ray spins and blocks a laser blast that they didn't see coming. Her robes fall from her shoulders, revealing a battle-ready outfit of all black. A simple thank you would do, Ray remarks. She throws the double blade like a boomerang, ducks behind a power regulator as the spinning saber slices all in its path, then rises in time to catch it. This is a new weapon of her own design, made from the pieces of Anakin's broken lightsaber and her own staff. She wields it with grace. Poe ducks behind a generator, yells through lasers at Rey. You shouldn't have come here. You'd rather be killed, Rey replies. If it means you're safe, yeah, Poe responds. There's something more behind those words. Now's not the time, Rey says. Definitely not the time, says Poe. She force pushes a pack of eight, sending them clattering. The migrant workers point to Rey in awe, whispering. The children cheer, speaking a word they all know. Jedi, Jedi. More stormtroopers flood into the square, but the migrants block their path to protect Rey. Some throw rocks, others swing with hammers and tools. It's inspiring, a promise of revolution. Poe says, Rey, we gotta go. Rey hesitates, wanting to fight alongside these people. We have to help them, she says. Poe eyes more troop transports and incoming TIE fighters. Not here, not now. Rey knows he's right, but it kills her inside. She reluctantly follows her friends through the blast door. Finn moves to follow them, but his ankle is grabbed by a fallen stormtrooper, helmet blasted open. They lock eyes, recognition, a memory from long ago. Finn pulls free and continues on, but he's shaken. Back on the orbital ring, an officer races to Admiral Vaughn. What happened down there? The Admiral asks. The last Jedi is with them, sir, the officer replies. Vaughn's confidence turns to fear. Alert the Knights of Ren, the Admiral orders. Ray, Poe, Finn and Rose race towards a maintenance turbo lift that runs the length of the power shaft to the ring above. BB-8, we're coming up to you. Plan's gone sideways, Poe says. BB-8 has already left the orbital ring in a shuttle, on his way down to the rendezvous point on the planet's surface, per the plan. He beeps. Poe looks up at the ring above. We're going to need to get another ship, he says. You're not serious, Ray responds. His eyes settle on the eclipse. A colossal Star Destroyer docks just above them, an ivory pirate ship in space. That's Eclipse Class Dreadnought. You can't fly, I can fly anything. Rose hacks into the turbo lift. The glass door opens. We're in, she says. The door slides shut, cutting off the sound. Clench everything, Rose says. The turbo lift capsules rockets upwards into the tube, travelling from the planet's surface to the orbital ring in seconds. The turbo lift door opens to find the stern of the Eclipse Dreadnought right in front of them, miles wide. You sure about this? Ray says. Nope, says Poe. Rose remarks, we're better odds on Raxus Prime. That wasn't my fault. You need to let Raxus Prime go, Finn says. They hop into a glide rover and speed off. Back on the observation tower, Admiral Vaughn watches the glide rover race towards the Eclipse. Where are they going? says the Admiral. The glide rover disappears inside the packed destroyer. Admiral Vaughn cracks slightly as if the plan dawns on him. They can't possibly be planning this, he says. Admiral Vaughn leans over first order tech. How many men on that ship, he says. Just as the bridge crew, sir, the rest on dock leave. A massive navigational bridge dense with first order crew awaits Ray and the others. A laser blast spins around. Rose cocks her heavy weapon and Finn seals the door. Who's in charge here? Poe asks. A deck officer walks up. I am. Great, I'm your new pilot. Where does the pilot sit? Poe says. Ray loses patience and waves her palm towards the officer. You will set course for the Nirin system. Deck officer. Set course for the Nirin system. 
The crewmen turn and take their positions at the console, mind tricked and mass. Poe and Ray take the helm, pressing buttons and guessing. Cold start the engines. We can jump right to hyperspace if we overheat. The laser cannon drive, Ray says. The exhaust will spill over, Poe said. Ray interrupts it him. Into the propulsion systems, we can freeze the chamber. Poe looks to Ray as they flip switches, a gleam in his eye. Don't you see? You and I? How we? Not the time, Ray says. Finn sits at a massive control board with a hundred buttons. Okay, I'm going to need very specific instructions, he says. Rose goes to work on the Navi computer. Shields up! Setting calculations for light speed, Rose says. Let's go! Poe says. Don't rush me. I mess us up and we fly straight into a sun, Rose replies. Finn taps a screen in front of him. The ship's exterior lights click on. I found the lights! I turned, turned, on, turned on the lights, Finn says. One of the crewmen snaps out of his mind trick and eyes Finn. Who are you? The crewman asks. Finn knocks him out cold. Let's get somewhere fast, Finn says. Working on it, Poe responds. Poe eases his hand into the steering rig. Who uses inverted controls yoke? Poe asked. The eclipse roughly disengages and scrapes its way out. Fuel conduits unhinge and spits blue energy, slicing through the dock's infrastructure. The ship's exterior lights blink on and off in patch grids. Heavy cannons fire on the Eclipse's shields. Poe leans back. The craft dips down. The black empty part is where we should be pointed, Ray says. I'm trying, everything's backwards, Poe responds. Finn looks out the window at the planet rising into view as they tilt further down. I can fly anything, Finn mocks. Poe gains control of the craft's trajectory but not its axes. They are inverting. The planet rolls from the bottom of the massive front view to the top. Okay, we're rolling now, Ray said. Do we have the droid? Pa asks. BB-8's maintenance craft is hit. Burning, engineless, 50 feet from the dock. He'll never make it. BB-8 now, Ray says. BB-8 has to act. He ejects himself from the droid socket, floats 50 feet through the cold empty space and passes through the oxygen shield and lands inside the hangar with a clank. BB-8 beeps affirmatively on the comm link. We got him! Rose's console flashes. Good for light speed, Rose says. Ray leans past Poe and shoves the hyperdrive helm forward. Bars of light stretch out before them as they jump into hyperspace. The eclipse blurs and vanishes. Silence. We tilt up. Stars running down. A jag sinister ship jumps out from hyperspace. The Knife 9. Shaped like an arrowhead with adjustable wings, we follow it towards the orbital ring. Knife 9 lands on the exposed landing pad, protected by a quantum shield from the cold dangers of space. The Knights of Ren appear from their ship. Hataska Ren, the leader, armoured and caped in black, Ot Ren and Lol Ren, seems to work as a duo. Jadik Ren is the rogue, his mask evoking an angry ghost. Hataska eyes the scene in studied silence. He turns his ominous mask gaze towards Admiral Vaughn, here to meet him. We uploaded a Veil cipher to the droid. You'll have her location the moment a probe is within range, Admiral Vaughn says. Hatasco Ren draws his dark saber and cuts Vaughn down. A few stormtroopers instinctively raise their weapons. The other knights raise their heavy blasters. Officers and stormtroopers back away, tense and afraid. The knights holster their weapons and return to the ship, leaving Admiral Vaughn's body on Coruscant. A dense cloud layer pierced with skyscrapers. We follow a security craft down through the fog to reveal the city, unrecognisable from its prequel era days. New structures built atop the deco architecture of the Old Republic, growing older as we descend to the decrepit streets below. Sedimentary layers of progress. The security craft lands on a broad avenue, rife with despair. Immigrants from a thousand systems all seeking a better future for their children. The cruiser unloads a squad of eight stormtroopers on hovering Night Sister speeder bikes. They disappear down long alleys, spreading out into the populace. One buzzes past a dirty propaganda billboard with the familiar First Order symbol and a message. Join today. Someone is painted, don't, above the join. A street kid, Dade, 12 years old, eyes a pair of patrolling stormtroopers as they rough up a limbless alien. He picks up a piece of broken cement aims and throws. It hits the trooper in the head. 
Both spear and blasters up, but the kid is long gone. A banther horn sounds on high. Dave races through the plumes of smoke, past buildings with shocks of the Old Republic era technology, revealing a massive open plaza connected by a web of boulevards. The First Order capital towers over it, a jagged structure balancing on the surface like a spinning top. Thousands are gathered here, all eyes on days, where the capital guards hold a ragged, hooded figure in the crowd. The people look up at the sky, a hologram of Chancellor Hux, four stories tall. Dade weaves closer. Today, another conspirator stands with treason, Chancellor Hux says. The guards remove the conspirator's hood, revealing Biss Cover, our alien on the ground from the Kuak colony. Though support for his course has all but vanished, let this day remind us of the consequences for defying our supreme leader. The capital guards lead Biss Cover to a guillotine with a hissing light blade poised above. He stares silently ahead. Kylo Ren is not without pity, just as the traitor before you is not without remorse. So he offers to spare this man's life in exchange for the location of the Resistance base, Hux continues. Biss Cover remains defiant. Hux's hologram glows irritated. Koffa, Rebiva, Tora, Famila, Biss says. So be it, Hux says. Biss Cover is placed in the light blade guillotine. Cover, Rebiva, Tora, Famila. Cover for Rebiva, Tora, Famila, Biss Cover continues. A woman in the crowd covers Dade's eyes. He peels her fingers forward, an anger burning within. The light blade falls. Chancellor Hux, hair streaked with grey, looks down at the thousands gathered in Monument Square. The people are a distant blur from here. Boo heels click, revealing Commander Selick, Hux's second in military command. Sir, they're here, Selick says. A clawed hand reaches into a silver terrine of baby shacks, huddling together for warmth. We follow the squealing animal into the mouth of Lord Gurlid, an alien with razor teeth. It sits at the table of galactic warlords, tribal, wealthy, coated in elaborate robes and stolen jewels. Chancellor Hux speaks to them, nostrils flared at the smell. I assure you, the stolen destroyer will be found. Our probe droids are scouring the galaxy as we speak, Chancellor Hux says. Lord Gullard responds with his mouth full. A Dreadlord class warship just slipped through your fingers, Hux. Your words don't inspire confidence. A lone signal won't be difficult to find. Our transmissions blockade has silenced millions of systems, Hux continues. You can silence planets but not people. There have been uprisings. We must not allow the seeds of revolution to take root. Girlhood responds. The First Order will punish those who defy your rule. Submit your youth for conditioning. They, they will teach their elders under the rule of law. Hux continues. Jor Nult, a nasty dreadlord weak way. It's Skywalker they believe in, not the law. And his apprentice, this girl, this Jedi, she's become a symbol of hope. Rekar Shen, a species with curled spider fangs for teeth. The people will believe that she can destroy you, Hux, and your master... Kylo Ren is no master, certainly not mine, Hux responds. Ugmot, a shameless noid, pounds his head with his tiny hands. We must kill the Jedi! The Knights of Ren have been dispatched to eliminate her, Hux says. Our fate is in the hands of zealots? You ask for our confidence, yet provide nothing to inspire it. Where is Kylo Ren? Gurlid responds. The Supreme Leader will return when he acquires the knowledge he seeks. Hux answers. The warlords eye each other, not satisfied with that. When? Jor not alt asks. Hux seethes through his teeth. Soon. Mustafar. The terrain is obsidian-like, black and reflective. Jagged mountains spike in the distance. A cloaked figure in tattered rows rises into the frame. Kylo Ren, beard and wary. He checks the stars for navigation and climbs over a rock's precipice to reveal Darth Vader's abandoned castle in the distance. A drone droid, the X-20, floats just behind him. Stay here, he says. Kylo enters Vader's chamber, a forgotten, decrepit cathedral. Crumbling, pieces of the structure litter the ground, untouched for decades. Kylo lights his red guard cross saber, holds it up as a torch. Tiny creatures scurry at the disturbance. 
A haunting wind blows against his cheek, chilling him. Leave me alone, Kylo Ren says. This is where the dark path leads, an empty tomb, Luke says, behind him. And where did your path lead? You're a ghost. I know what you're searching for, Ben. Your master promised you strength, but you feel hollow, Luke answers. Soon I will be even more powerful than any Jedi. Even you, Kylo responds. You sure? Luke asks. Kylo snaps and spins and swings his lightsaber empty space. With a billow of cold wind, Luke's spirit is gone. Go home, Ben. Go home to Leia, Luke says as he fades away. Kylo is shaken, but on the altar beyond, the artifact he came for is here. A Sith holocron. He kneels before it and holds out his palm, channeling the force. The three sides of the pyramid pull away, revealing an energy within. It grows in intensity and projects a hologram. Palpatine, recorded decades ago. Lord Vader. Young Skywalker will soon be ours, I have foreseen it. But we must prepare for the unforeseen. Should he strike me down, you will take him to the Remnicor system. There you will find Torvalum, master of the Sith who instructed me, Palpatine says. Here, the son of Skywalker will acquire a great ability beyond what you could hope to command in your damaged state. With it, he will harness the untapped power of Mortis, and at last we will realise the holocram alarms. Kylo Ren is not Darth Vader. Palpatine's image fades. The destiny and potential, it continues as it fades. A blast of red lightning shoots from the pyramid device into Kylo's eyes. The invasive pulse of energy spreads over his face like a cancer. Horrible, raw, purple veins streak through his skin. He screams in deep, unbearable pain. Back at the resistance base on Korolev, a pair of blue eyes snap open. Ben, Leia says. Leia Organa grips a stone wall, regaining balance. Her hair is long and grey, her robes white. A wise and elegant leader, Leia has suffered more loss than a human can endure, but she remains a rock in a raging river. She stands overlooking a terrain of rainforest dusted with crisp white snow. Korolev, the Resistance secret base. She seeks a presence behind her. Speak! <laughs> says Chewbacca. Chewbacca approaches with Lieutenant Connix, wounded in battle since we last saw her. She now has a visible scar. They've returned, General, Connix says. Mission accomplished, Leia asks. Not exactly, Connix responds. Connix nods to the sky above, and Leia turns to see the Eclipse Star Destroyer descending to the planet full over the snowy jungle and escorted by X-Wings. They look like flies next to it. Back on the bridge, Leia storms onto the bridge as the First Order officers are escorted out in handcuffs. You are in strict violation of the Corellian Accords, the First Officer yells. Yeah, put it on my tab, Poe responds. Rose rips the officer's ID bars off of his uniform. You mind I collect these, Rose says. What should we do with them, General? Connix asks. Cook them dinner, they look thin, Leia responds. The First Order officer turns. The punishment for your act of rebellion will be swift and the door shuts in his face. Scan the ship. This thing could be crawling with enemy troopers, Leia says. But our team didn't consider that, did they? She says as she turns to Poe. Come on, tell me you haven't always wanted one of these, Poe says. Leia gives him a look, insufferable. Prepare for evacuation when leaving, Leia orders. What? Why? You stole a Star Destroyer, Leia says. I disabled their home and beacon, we're free and clear, Rose says. Would you bet your life on that, Leia asks. That stops them both. Leia looks past her then to Ray, in a corridor off the bridge, alone. Go. Leia approaches Finn. How's she doing? Hard to tell. Maybe you can talk to her? Finn asks. She doesn't need a master right now. She needs a friend, Leia says. Finn approaches Ray, tentative. You okay? He asks. I failed, she responds. Don't say that. They know our tactics. We've been fighting this for way too long. Finn tries to reassure her. Ray says, those people, the children, I saw hope in their eyes. They believe in you, we all do, he says. I can't be who they need me to be, I'm not strong enough, Ray continues. That's not true, Finn says. Every night I wake up screaming, every night another bad dream. Is it him, Finn asks. There's something between us, I can't explain it, she says. You have to shut him out, he can't change, it's too late, he tries to convince her. It's never too late to change, you taught me that, she says. 
Chewbacca brays excited. He's looking out a small rectangular porthole in the hull of the ship. Where is it, buddy? Finn turns. Chewie opens the blaster, revealing a mile-long arsenal of decommissioned Imperial weaponry. Ships, walkers, urban assault vehicles, mounds of heavy artillery. Finn's eyes light up. This is enough firepower to take out the capital. Poe, you need to see this. Poe and Rose join them on the Overlook. It's a game changer. See, when I've ever come back empty-handed, this, this was the plan. Poe tries to convince Finn. Was it? Rose asks. We have ships, weapons, all we need now is an army. How? N nobody can hear us, we're in the dark. They turn to Ray, those words resonating with her. We don't have to be. Back on the Millennium Falcon, Ray opens the ancient Jedi text from Acto, laid out on the ho hollow chest table. Finn, Poe and Rose and Chewie gathered around. The Jedi had communications system before the Old Republic. It was powered by a nexus beneath the temple. Sketches of a tower in the old Jedi temple on Coruscant, light flowing from the spire into space. A force beacon engineered to call all systems to war, Ray says. No, there's no way it still works, Finn responds. Old Republic tech is better than the junk we have today, Poe says. That frequency predates the Empire by a thousand years. The First Order's blockade couldn't disrupt the signal, Rose continues. It's worth a shot, Finn says. They look to Poe, the de facto leader. Anything's worth a shot. Chewbacca roars. Yeah, I hope so too, Ray. Ray hesitates for a reason. She doesn't yet understand. A dark, ominous feeling. She snaps back to them. Hope is all we have left, she says. Back at the Resistance base on the Jedi Dojo, a wooden bow stick hits a pillar, coughing dust. Light pours through an open sinkhole and an elaborate wooden Jedi sparring post. Extensions on all sides, like branches of a tree. It moves, rotating the base, limbs spinning. Ray combats it with aggressive elegance, blindfolded. She spins, ducks, leaps, climbing while fighting. A swinging post connects with Ray's back. She hits the ground, wincing in pain. Your pain is an illusion, Luke says. It doesn't feel like an illusion, Ray responds. She braces herself and attacks the post again. A double flip and Ray sticks the landing. But then she falters, sensing a disturbance. We go back now to the First Order Capital, landing pad, at night. A pair of porcine ognauts push a levitating stretcher away from the TIE silencer. On it, Kylo, in the worst shape that we left him, damaged veins stretching down his neck. He screams as he goes on the operating table, surrounded by medical droids. Layers of Mandalorian iron are smelted to his face. A discomforting sizzle as they work. Kylo grits his teeth. Ray touches her cheek, feeling a sharp but distant pain. As Kylo continues to scream, a jolt of electricity flows into the iron on his face, finishing the job. He's suddenly racked by a vision. A mountain. Snow on the jagged peaks, and a temple older than all known time. A massive ch ancient chamber, with two massive thrones built into the rock. A well of light pulsing from deep below. Ray is racked by the same vision, but it continues. Hooded and masked, Kylo Ren activates his red lightsaber, facing off with Ray before the two thrones. They fight, vicious and intense. With a sharp swing of Kylo's lightsaber, he strikes Ray down. She tears off the blindfold, breathless. What do you see? Luke asks. I saw a mounting two thrones in the rock, and Kylo Ren... He was changed. Luke Skywalker steps into the light, a more tangible form of the Force Ghost, similar to his projected self on Crate. You saw the future, Luke says. Kylo saw it too. I could feel him, like he was there with me. Where? where? Luke asks. Mortis, Ray says. Luke turns grave. He sits as Obi-Wan once sat beside him. What do you know of Mortis, Luke asks. It's an ancient place from a time before the Jedi, before the Sith. Two thrones, two powerful beings, one of darkness, the other of light. Together they brought balance. But it's a myth. So was I, if you remember, Luke responds. Luke is almost present now. All traces of blue light are gone. Beneath the Temple of Mortis lies a power beyond anything the Jedi have ever known. If Kylo reaches the temple, all we fought for will be lost. You have to confront him, Luke continues. 
You want me to... To kill Leia's son? Ray asks. The Force guides us towards balance. It doesn't always show us what we want to see. Luke says. Ray scoffs, angry. Balance. Dark suffocates the light. Light extinguishes the dark over and over. How is that balance? Ray asks. I know that anger. I had it. My father had it too. Luke says. So says my master. And he's master before him. A thousand masters so eager to tell us how to live. Ray says. She looks through an arched opening at the resistance base below. Finn and Rose calibrating a grappling cannon. Poe and Chewie working on the Falcon. I spent my whole life wanting a family and now I've got one. I don't want to abandon them, Ray says. The Force is speaking to you, Ray. Luke replies. Maybe I'm not who it thinks I am, Ray remarks. Who are you? Luke says. I'm no one. If that's what you believe, then the last Jedi is dead, Luke says. Ray sets her practice staff alongside the others. Maybe he is, Ray finishes. Carlos' medical slab rises vertical. He looks into a mirror at his altered face, half covered with smelted iron. A monster. Finish it, he commands. A new mask lowers onto his head and locks into place, spitting steam. We don't see the front of it, not yet. A strip of glowing buttons light up the underside of his forearm. The med droid presses a code and the helmet beeps. Breathe, the med droid says. He does. A new sound, different than Vader's. Guttural. Deep. Back on Coruscant, we enter Chancellor Hux's chamber. Ornate drapes and an indoor fountain. A huge throne-like chair faces the city through a massive circular window. Hux removes his trench coat and pointed hat and catches himself in the mirror. Touch he touches the streak of grey hair. He peers into a glass case at an object of his affection. A lightsaber resting on a pedestal. A collector's item. He gazes it with envy. Hux removes a few coins from his pocket and places them on the table. He extends his hand and tries to use the force to move it. It doesn't budge, and his face grows red from trying. Mm -hmm. Hux says as he tries to use the force. Kylo. Has all been well in my absence? Hux startles, embarrassed. Kylo's masked face is in shadow. Supreme Leader, you've returned. If I'd known... I don't need grand displays and processions or titles, Chancellor. Ren responds. Kylo steps into the light. The new mask is reminiscent of his first, but sharper, nastier and scarier. My knights tell me the girl was within your grasp. Apparently, your knights took it among themselves to deal with my general's failure, Huck says. And how shall I address your failure? Carlo asks. Huck turns whiter and takes a small step back. What happened to your... Carlo interrupts him. She's beloved, isn't she? Belief is the solace of peasants. The people claim to folklore, but they fear the First Order, Huck says. They fear me! Soon I will command the Force in ways unseen since the ancients, he says. The power described in the Sith texts, you, you found it? Hux asks. It is within my reach. The ability to destroy a planet will be insignificant. What are your orders? Hux asks. Find the resistance. Wipe them out. And the girl? Leave her to me. Back at the resistance base, inside the briefing room, a hologram of the capital lights up. Poe stands before the resistance leadership, laying nearby. As you know, the First Order has silenced communication between all neighbouring systems. The source of the blockade is a transmission jammer deep in the First Order capital on Coruscant, here. The capital hologram blinks, zooms, a cube within. So far, we've been able, unable to find a weakness. No thermal exhaust port, no oscillator. In other words, they're onto us. Leia smiles, proud of Poe. Our forces are too depleted to mount a direct assault, but we've found an alternative. An analog system from the days of the Old Republic. The capital hologram dissipates to make room for a new structure, the Jedi Temple. Schematics of an ancient machine powered by a kyber crystal. A small team will activate the beacon and summon the galaxy to war. The hologram demonstrates a light shooting from the center spire and connects 50 other planets like dots. When they succeed, the rest of us will be ready. Finn steps forward, eyes alive. I'll lead the team, General. Rose steps forward with a grin. I'll lead the team, General, but I'll let him think he's doing it. 
Leia's eyes turn to Rey, sensing her conflict. Rey? She asks. They're looking for me. It's dangerous enough as it is. I can't go with you, Leia says. Poe's smile fades. Leia doesn't press it, turning to the rest of the room. Prepare to evacuate. We'll reconvene at the rendezvous point. Leia finishes. The camera turns to R2-D2 and C-3PO. Coruscant? A good idea from those scrambled circuits of yours. Coruscant will be quite pleasant this time of year, C-3PO responds. R2 beeps a little. Yes, a properly refined city will be much more welcome after hovering down here like a gun dark. Poe turns to Ray. Hey, what was all that about? I have to bring an end to all of this. I have to confront him. Mm-hmm. You're just going to confront him? Who talks like that? Jedi do. I'm new to all of this, Ray says. Okay, I'm going with you, Poe responds. No, I have to go alone, she says. Is that in your book too? Where in this confrontation going to happen? Mortis in the unknown regions, Ray responds. Mortis is a myth, Poe says. It isn't, I saw it. Oh, you saw it? And how do you plan on finding it? Ray hesitates, unsure. I'll figure it out, she says. She walks away. Poe follows, determined. Hey, look, I know you want to think I'm wasted air on any mission, Master Jedi. Please stop calling me that, Ray says. But the thing is, I know someone who can find what you're looking for. Hey, if it's one of your friends from the Flight Academy, I swear... Poe interrupts. It's not one of those guys, but those guys are great. Ray continues. Because they are unreliable at best, and I am being nice. She's a navigator, lives on Bonadon. Force sensitive like you. Well, not exactly like you. Space diggers used her to pay to find deposits on asteroids, Poe says. Do you trust her? Ray asks. She's a little off, but if this place exists, she can find it, he responds. Ray softens. Poe is now standing closer to her than he's ever been. Hey, I get it. No attachments. Jedi path. I've read that story too, but I'm just saying you don't have to do this alone, Poe says. Leia continues planning the evacuation. Through layers of pilots and notices Ray and Poe in the corridor, she recognises the romantic tension. Her knowing look quickly turns to concern. Finn tightens a bolt on the grappling cannon and a loud clank startles him. He closes his eyes, left hand shaking. Hey, it's okay, Rose says. Finn's past has followed him for years. Memories of friends, kidnapped and conditioned to serve. One of the storm I saw on QAP. I knew him, we trained together. When we were kids, he looked so scared. I remember that feeling, Finn says. I don't think that feeling will ever go away, Rose responds. I can't let more of them end up like me. It has to stop. Rose puts a calming hand on his. He breathes easier. That's what we're fighting for, she says. Back at Kylo Ren's chamber, Kylo glazes at down at Darth Vader's burned mask, speaking once more to the grandfather he never knew. I understand you now. Your weakness, your pain. You allowed love to cloud your judgement. I will succeed where you failed. He grips Vader's masks and exits onto his balcony. A thousand feet up, a layer of clouds below, stars above. Carlo holds Vader's mask out over the edge and lets it go. It plunges below the clouds and shatters. Kylo Ren goes back to his TIE silencer and lowers into his cockpit. His drone VX-20 settles into the data lock over his right shoulder. Set a course for Remy Corps. VX beeps in a fermentation. Hux watches Kylo's TIE silencer fly into the starfield above. Goodbye, Ren, Hux says to himself. Commander Selleck approaches. Sir, one of our probes picked up the droid signal. We found them. Ready my ship. I want to witness their extinction myself, Huck says. Shall I inform the Supreme Leader? Selleck asks. No, let Kylo and the girl fulfill their empty promises of their ancient religion. In the end, they'll destroy each other as Jedi and Sith always have. Then we will rise, strong and decisive, ready to bring true order to the galaxy, Huck says. Commander Selleck eyes Hux, unnerved by him. Prepare the attack, Hux says. Back at the Resistance base, buzzing energy as the Resistance evacuates the base. Poe and Chewbacca load up into the Millennium Falcon. Because I'm not sending her out there alone, that's why, Poe says. <laughs> Chewie, that my Wookie? Chewie's, Chewie, Chewie responds. Will you trust me, Poe asks. Nearby, Rose and Finn load up the Phantom Hawk, her junky but reliable ship, pieced together from parts. 
Rose has the hood open, tinkering with the innards. This is a Corellian hyperdrive, R2. Do we have a key code for this? Rose asks. R2 projects a hologram of key codes and finds a match. This is every hyperdrive key in the old Imperial fleet. They still use these. R2, where do you get this? R2 beeps. I told you to erase the data from Bespin's central computer. You don't know where it's been, C-3PO says. Finn looks past at the droid Saray, loading up the Falcon with Poe and Chewie. He approaches her. Guess this is goodbye, Finn says. You've come a long way since Jakku, Finn says. So have you, Ray responds. She looks at the Resistance and back at Finn. They trust you. They should. Finn and Ray hug. They say nothing, but it means everything. Poe appears, BB-8 rolling alongside him. We should get out of here before he realises his awkward intrusion. Oh, sorry, I... Finn pulls Poe in strongly and hugs him. Finn turns back to Ray. Take care of him. I will, she responds. Finn swallows his emotion and forces himself to be away to the Phantom Hawk, where Rose sweats under the engine bay. No, hop on board, relax, I'll handle all of this work, Rose says. Ray watches Finn board the ship, nothing but love for her friend. Beyond the Phantom Hawk, Leia approaches. Leia, I... you don't have to say it, Leia says. Right, full sensitive. I can save your son. I believed that once, like you. There's good in him, Ray says. There's good in all of us, but the boy I knew, he is gone. Be careful, Ray, Leia says. Master Luke trained me well, Ray responds. Some things you can't train for. Leia looks to Poe, then back at Ray, then back to Poe, then back at Ray. No, 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 you've got it wrong, Ray says. Come on, I know how complicated this is, Leia remarks. I can't, there are rules, Jedi rules, Ray says. Leia scoffs. Written by who, some old man a thousand years before you were born? My whole life, I heard one word, balance. I never really understood what it meant until the first time I saw you. I heard that word again, like it was whispered to me. Balance. You're not like my father. Or my brother. You're new. Whatever happens, remember, the Force chose you, Ray. Your story isn't written by anyone else. A loud explosion shakes the mountain. Dust crumbles, alarms blare, massive blips on radar screens. Resurgent class star destroyer detected. We're taking fire. A resistance tech yells. In orbit, the finalizer bears down on the planet while two other First Order starships arrive from light speed, flanking it. Hux looks out at the glowing planet below. Decimate any ships leaving the planet. Charge the primary weapon. Alarms flash. Pilots run for their ships. Resistant guards surround Leia. Emergency evac. All personnel and craft to rendezvous point crimson. Route all unarmored transports to the Eclipse. It's our only way out, Leia orders. Leia locks eyes with Ray. Ray, we have to go! Ray! Poe yells. Ray races up the Falcon's ramp. Poe yells to Finn. Go, get out of here! Rose and Finn hurry into the Phantom Hawk. Transports and fighters fly out of the hangar towards the waiting eclipse hidden in a deep canyon. Back in the Millennium Falcon cockpit, Ray and Poe instinctively spin into the pilot's seats. Chewie doesn't like it. He roars. I know, I know, it's your seat, Poe says. Chewie bangs the wall. That's his damn chair. Ray starts flipping switches. Can we talk about this later? In the Phantom Hawk, Rose reverses the ship out of the hangar. Another blast from the Star Destroyer pulses the shields. I'm afraid our shields cannot withstand a super laser of this magnitude. Tell me the odds, 3PO. I like numbers, Rose says. Finn watches the Millennium Falcon rise out of the sinkhole. Good luck, Ray, he says to himself. In the Millennium Falcon cockpit, Ray answers Finn as if he's next to her. You too. The Falcon rises out of the deep sinkhole to the surface where the jungle is on fire. Laser blasts pound the mountain base from above, relentless. Just inside the shield barrier, transports and fighters fly into the open docking bays of the Eclipse Star Destroyer like bees into a hive, safe inside. Leia takes her command position on the bridge of the Eclipse, now fully manned by Resistance personnel. Shields are at 80%, General, we can't wait any longer, Connix remarks. She takes one look at Korolev. Another home taken from her, Leia thinks to herself. Back on the finalizer Star Destroyer, Hux's pale face glows from super laser fire. Primary weapon charge, sir, an operator says. Fire! Hux responds. Back in the Phantom Hawk, Finn and Rose feel the heat of explosions all around them as light bends ahead and they escape into hyperspace. On the Eclipse Bridge, 
Leia closes her eyes, feeling the loss of the men and women left behind as the Eclipse makes the jump to light speed. The Eclipse vanishes in an instant, and the finalizer super laser finally cracks the shields. The base erupts. The entire planet explodes in hellfire. From the Ring of Destruction, the Millennium Falcon rockets out into space. The ship rattles. Mountainous chunks of space rock spin from the exploded planet, creating a field of obstacles all around them. Chewbacca whines. I know, I know, Poe responds to Chewbacca's rhyme. We can't make the jump with all the debris. Ray turns to Poe. Neither can that Star Destroyer. Chewie, cloak our signal. The Falcon quakes. Damage alarms blare. They swerve and dodge through the chunks of the destroyed planet. Some pieces still intact with white mountains, jungle valleys, and waterfalls frozen by the cold of space. A familiar ship enters into the blazing pursuit, the dark and jagged Knife Nine. In the Knife Nine, Jadik Ren at the helm, Ott and Lul flank him in the evolated gunship chairs. In the deep background, Hataska floats in an electro-oxygen chamber, tubes weaving around his body. Ott and Lul unload waves of targeted blasts onto the Falcon exploding remnants of the planet when they miss the ship. The Falcon is hammered with laser fire, relentless. Who is this? Poe asks. Ray eyes push the pursuing ship onto the rearview graphic monitor. Let me fly, Ray orders. I've got the yoke, my yoke, Poe says. My ship, Ray responds. Chewy wars, both wrong. The Knife Nine pursues the Falcon through the spinning pieces of the Korolev, trying to avoid collision without losing the target. The Falcon gets close to one of the planetary fragments and buzzes the surface, dodging blasts as it flies up the face of a frosted jungle mountain in space. The horizon spins as the fragment spirals from above both ships, spinning out on its chaotic trajectory. Suddenly the mountain is inverted, among them is blackness of the space below. Poe fires on the jagged mountain peak, hanging above them now like a satellite. The mountain peak blasts apart, sending projectiles spinning into the path of the pursuing craft. The knife line is hit by a sharp piece of rocky mountain top, sending it wildly off course. We're clear, Ray shouts. Punch it! Light bends ahead and the rocket into space. Alarms blare as the knife nine spins out of control. Jadik Wren manages to regain control, righting the ship, but the Falcon is gone. Jadik approaches the electro oxygen chamber, eyeing her tasker through the glass. Wise protitude from his mask into the main computer. He's in some kind of induced sleep. What do you see, brother? Jadik asks. Jadik places his hands on the glass. Suddenly, Hataska does the same, hand flat on the glass against Jadik's. Lawl and Ott look up, waiting for an answer. Jadik's head tilts up. He nods and removes his hand from the glass. Set course for Bonadon, Jadik says. Meanwhile, Carlo's TIE silencer enters the atmosphere of a cold black planet veined with silver. It touches down on a ridge overlooking a wide valley of obsidian-like terrain, Frozen trees in windsept shapes, floors of white lava. Kylo approaches an ancient stone military battlement consumed by time. Skeletons of fallen war beasts litter the terrain. Whatever battle happened here ended centuries ago. He passes empty suits of armor, robes draped over broken shields, flags flutter in the wind, a Sith helmet on the ground, skull vis visible with inside. A reminder that while the Jedi live on, the Sith become dust. His tracking beacon flashes a single red dot. Lifeform detected. The door opens to the Sith Temple, revealing Kylo, hand extended. He enters a circular chamber stacked with broken spacecraft parts, ancient military technology and piles of silver ore. A glowing white fire crackles in a stone pit. A voice whispers as he draws closer to the flame. Reveal yourself, says the voice. Kylo's lightsaber ignites, a reflex action. I seek the Sith Master, Tor Valum, Kylo responds. I am no master, Tor Valum says. The mountain of junk moves from it as if disguised within comes Tor Valum. 7,000 years old, an alien of unknown origin, spinely intense, sinew and muscle pull tight. But I was once called Tor Valum. Kylo remains state fast, dominant. You trained Darth Plagueis, Kylo said. That name means nothing to me, Torvalon responds. Carlo's lightsaber flashes in anger, settling inches from Torvalon's taut, leathery skin. Does your life? Kylo asks. Torvalon regards Kylo, smiles with sharp teeth. You threaten me with death, how amusing, Torvalon says. You are weak, I feel nothing, Kylo says. Torvalon looks towards Ren. 
You feel what I allow you to feel, child. The creature extends a long finger, pointing to Carlo's mask. Reveal yourself. Carlo removes his mask. His face is feigned and corrupted, worse than we remember. Torvalum appears oddly entertained. Mm, you wish to attain the power of those who came before. Take your place among the gods of Mortis. I do, Carlo says. To rule the galaxy without armies, without starships? Tor Torvalum asks. Yes. Ren responds. Yet you feel the frailty of your vessel. You need this power, Torvalum says. Carlo's jaw tenses. He nods. Kneel before me, Torvalum commands. Miraculously, Carlo kneels. You call yourself a Sith, but the Sith are unrepentant, remorseless. You're haunted by the past, your very existence. I have no regrets, Kylo Ren says. You lie. Until you sever yourself from the past, your fate will be the same as theirs. Torvalum motions to the battlefield and below. Empty Jedi Knight armor, vacant Sith Marauder armor beside it, withered husks of animals and men. The living force is nourishment. The more one consumes, the stronger one becomes. To take life is to cheat death. The creature lifts his body with his arms and walks on them. Kylo eyes his strange new master. Teach me, Kylo Ren asks. Cutting to Bonadon, the falcon descends into a valley of cylindrical mountains rising over water spotted with junk boats. This planet exists in permanent sunset, lit by its busting night markets. The falcon lands on a multi-level docking array. It feels like a tower of lily pads, a visiting ship on each one. Poe argues with two stumpy langlogs, Oak and Socko, at the base of the Millennium Falcon's ramp. I know it's a Corellian light freighter, but you're going to say it's a Prador cruiser in the registry. That's why I winked. That's why I gave you the money. You understand what's happening here? Oak and Socko chat in their alien language, voices rising. Okay, which one of you is in charge because you're both the size of children where I come from? Ray exits the Falcon, Poe stops her. Whoa, you can't come out like that. You look like a Jedi. What's that supposed to mean, Ray asks. Just tone it down a little. Chewie, will you straighten these guys out? Chewbacca takes over negotiations with the Langlogs. The landing pad rotates and descends, lowering the Falcon's platform to water level. An elegant and fluid system. Poe leads Ray towards a toothless merchant, selling jewellery and sari-like robes. How much for this one, Poe says. Ray takes out her credits, and the merchant shakes her head, closes Ray's hand around the money, and gives them the clothes for free. Thank you, Ray says. Ah! Chewie has one of the Langlos lifted onto the ground, using him as a bargaining chip against the other one. Ah, oh, Chewie, I said negotiate, not persuade, and quietly, Poe says. Chewie shakes his head and whines. Ray and Poe step off a junk boat ferry in a sensory overload of lights, smells and tastes. Aliens and humans haggle over the prices of artisan crafts and live animals. Packs of teenagers eat bizarre street food from market stalls, and kids laugh at buskers and street performers. A freak show hawker begs them to come over to a contained booth. Come and witness the frothing eye of loyal Khan, the hawker says. They walk among the oddities and wonders, undercover. Ray's colourful sari gives her an exotic elegance that we've never seen. She uncomfortably adjusts her incognito hooded pullover. I like it, you look local, Poe says. You've been here before, Ray asks, with my grandfather. I used to sail right out there. You've never seen so many lights, Poe says. What do you remember? Ray digs for a memory before her abandonment. My father and I would build starships out of food. They would fit in right in your hand. Anything else? Poe asks. I remember love. That's why I waited so long. But I must have imagined it. They were no one, Ray says. Poe looks at her in the settling sunlight, wishing he could change the past for her, but unable. No one is no one, Poe says. Ray takes her in, and then she spots a trio of me mech troopers scanning the crowd ahead. Poe follows her eyes and puts his hand in his blaster. No, Ray says. She pulls Poe into a market stall, eyeing them through hanging cloth. An old female Utai peddler barks at them to taste a spicy clawfish that she's selling. Kassan, nep, nep, the peddler says. No, not hungry, Poe remarks. She holds out the steaming ladle to Poe and encourages her. DP, Kassanan! One of the mech troopers look in their direction. Okay, here, just shh. Poe drinks from the soup ladle. Mmm, see? Mmm, Ray says. 
His face turns red and he coughs from the intense heat. The Utah and her friends laugh. Ah oh, no, today? The peddler says. No, it's... <coughs> no, it's good, Poe says. He coughs harder, getting worse. The mech trooper moves in in their direction, hearing the violent coughing. Ray grabs Poe by the shirt and pulls him into a kiss, hiding his face behind her headscarf. The mech trooper sees the two lovers from afar, while the Utah woman applaud in the background. He moves on. Ray and Poe pull apart, but he takes a moment to, cover, to recover. He's never been kissed by a Jedi. Did it work, Ray said. I mean, I think so, Poe responds. Ray looks past him at the mech troopers walking away. Oh, so that wasn't... No, Ray says. They eye each other, wishing the Force could stop time. We should... Yeah, right, they say to each other. A circular room draped with colourful silks. Devoted followers sit around the edges, smoking all manners of pipes and vaporizer devices. An electropathast plays ethereal music. Nomi, a tiny alien child who appears no more than five, sits on a pillow at the centre of a floor made of marbles. She consults quietly with an alien couple on the brink of divorce. They cry, touching foreheads. Ray and Poe enter through hanging beads. Easy on the detail, she doesn't have to know who or why, just what, Poe says. Nomi senses Ray and smiles past the couple in front of her. A Jedi! The last one, Nomi says. All eyes turn to Poe and Ray. All this, we can do it this way, Poe says. Nomi nods at a couple before her, touching their chests. Go. She then points to Ray. Come, sit, the Jedi and the man. Conspiratorial sides in the gallery, Ray and Poe walk barefoot over the marbles fitted in the stone floor. You seek a place, Nomi says. Planet. Mortis. This is the place you seek, Nomi says. Yes, I saw it in... Nomi cuts her off. The mouth of the Jedi stops and the mind takes the picture. The force fills the Jedi and reveals the destination. Poe nods encouragingly. Ray closes her eyes and breathes. The tiny marbles in the floor fall and rise into the air, taking the three-dimensional shape of the galaxy all around them. This destination is very old, Nomi continued. The first to know the force, the first where the good was done, and the evil too. Ray opens her eyes, surrounded by floating marbles. Which one? The destination lies within, Nomi says. Look, we're in a hurry, Poe says, but is interrupted by Nomi. The man will not speak. The marbles swirl around Ray, a galaxy around her. The eyes close. Only the Jedi knows the path, Nomi says. Nomi's voice grows distant as Ray falls into a deep meditation. She sees Mortis. The autumn leaves in the valley below and snow on the peak of a mountain. There the two will meet, drawn together by the Force, Nomi says. She sees the temple, two thrones in a rock, a well of light pulsing from deep within the mountain below. The dark side and the light, Nomi says. A cloaked figure, standing before Rei, his mask unmistakable. There she will make the sacrifice, Nomi says. A f the flash of a red lightsaber, jarring, violent as Kylo Ren strikes Rei down. Rei snaps out of her vision. Wait, what? Poe says. A flat black oval stone at the centre of the marble array falls from orbit into Nomi's palm. What do you mean sacrifice? Poe says. She hands it to a rabbit-sized Astro Scrivener, GEB, seated at a tiny easel. He paints a star map of the chosen location. The Jedi must go alone, Nomi says. No, hold on a second, Poe uh, interrupts. Jeb, the Astro Scrivener, tears the drawn planetary map of his easel, limps her in and hands it over. Thank you, Ray says. We're not leaving. What did she see? What did you see, Ray? Poe says. The Jedi will make the journey. The journey will answer the question. What journey? Please, can we... What question? Can we all just take a deep breath and talk about this? Ray stops at the door. Is there another path? There is always another path, Noma responds. Back on Coruscant, Rose's Phantom Hawk descends through the skyscraper canyons. The city plunges underground below them, dense and alive like roots of a tree. Finn and Rose observe through the cockpit panel. So many people living underground, Finn says. The rich folks don't spend much time thinking about what they're standing on, Rose says. Finn eyes the darkened Jedi Temple in the distance. That's it. Drop R2 and 3 pure off at street level, Finn's orders. I'm afraid all my knowledge of Coruscant is limited to the upper levels, C-3PO responds. R2 beeps. 
Elitist? Where do you even learn these words? The Phantom Hawk rises from the streets, leaving R2 and C-3PO behind. The ship ascends from the darkened roof of the skyscraper in skeletal stage, lights off. An unfinished floor beams and the griders only. Rose and Finn open a case, fold out their grappling cannon. Rose bolts the gun into a concrete floor and Finn attaches a sniper scope to the muzzle of the cannon. Aims at the top of the Jedi Temple and fires. Ready? The grappling cannon sticks and they harness in. You don't have a fear of heights, do you? Rose asks. It's not the height I'm afraid of, it's hitting the ground, Finn responds. So you'll be fine if we don't fall, Rose jokes. They unlatch and zipline a thousand feet above the city. They crash through the shattered window and unbuckle. The chamber is barely recognisable, lost and forgotten. Finn takes out his comm. R2, you have that message ready? R2 beeps and he leads C-3PO through the decrepit courtyard at the base of the Jedi Temple. A sad reminder of a better time. This doesn't look like the Jedi Temple to me, C-3PO responds. They move past the oil drum fires and covetous looks from the city dwellers, the poorest of the poor. What do you mean I stand out? Gold is not ostentatious. Lead the vocabulary to me, you glorified mechanic. A vagabond alien steps in front of 3PO. Several others appear from behind, rubbing their hands across their wares. Excuse me? Oh, oh my! The storm a stormtrooper comes into view. Get away from that droid! The dwellers scatter. The strobe shuts off, revealing the light and audio recording came from R2-D2. Thank goodness, don't ever leave me again. So the stormtrooper was just a recording. R2-D2 leads them through a crumbled wall inside the temple, revealing the grand entrance hall. Gothic arch ceilings over a massive kyber crystal mounted like a holy structure. Rose and Finn run their fingers along the smooth walls. Rose finds a pyramid-shaped socket. Found one, Finn says. Finn finds another identical panel across the room. He unwraps a pair of crystals and throws at one. No! Rose yells as she catches it. 5,000 year old kyber crystal, very rare. You hand it to me, Rose says. Sorry, Finn apologises. They insert the crystals into the sockets. Ready? Three, two, click. The spire rumbles. The floor opens and a huge copper machine rises up. Old Republic tech around a central conducting chamber. Power flows through it, humming and grand. Then it shorts out. Sparks fall and the machine goes dark. Can't it just be easy one time? Rose remarks. Back on Remnicor, a three-tusked gronk boar squealed, struggling to run into the pl place. The animal's eyes roll back as the living force is drained into Kylo's open hand, reducing it to a husk. Kylo opens his eyes. His face has more life. His eyes brighter, his scars receded, empowered and grateful. Torvalon smiles like a parent who just taught his child how to ride a bicycle. More, Kylo says. There is no more. You have consumed all life that remains, Torvalon says. A wind cuts from its ice cave beyond, a faint glow within. What's down there, Kylo asks. A vengeance, Valum says. I can feel it. There is more within. Go, Valum commands. Kylo puts on his mask and enters. The light from the Kylo Ren's red saber refracts onto the vast walls. The cave is empty but not silent. There is sound from the darkness. Breathing. From the shadows comes the hulking presence of Darth Vader. Kylo stands his ground, lightsaber up, unsure what is happening. Vader ignites his own weapon and swings. Kylo blocks. Vader strikes again, forcing this, the descendant of Skywalker to defend himself. It's a brutal fight. Intense lightsaber combat between two iconic villains. But Kylo is no match. Vader strikes him down and he screams in pain. He falls to the ground. Kylo struggles to remove his mask, breathless, and looks down at his chest wound. It no longer exists. He's alone. He staggers from the cave and angry and disorientated. Where is Mortis? The well of the living force. The source of the galaxy's birth. I want to be stronger than those who came before. Where is it? Kylo's eyes are alive and hungry. You are not worthy of its power. Not yet, Valum says. Kylo reaches out his arm and the force holds Torvalum, delving far into his mind. Where is Mortis? Kylo repeats. Torvalum's smile grows away. He's gri he grits his teeth, pained as Kylo probes and extracts. Release me, 
Fallon commands. I see it. Betrayer, I gave you knowledge, Fallon says. A mountain in winter, no fall, Kylo says. I gave you everything, Valen says as he struggles in pain. I know, you've given me so much. The light of the living force drains from Torvalum into Kylo's open hand. Thank you, he finishes. The ancient being falls dead, reduced to a withered shell. Back on Bunadan, Rey collapses and a powerful disturbance courses through her. What is it? Poe asks. He's growing stronger, Rey says. Poe looks around the market as if Kylo is nearby. We don't have much time, Rey says. Back in the Jedi Temple, sparks fly as Rhodes wheels the broken conductor into place. Will this thing work on old modern droids? Finn asks. You're asking me about the mechanics of a force-powered antenna, Rey said. Out of your realm of expertise? Finn asks. Out of anyone's realm of expertise, Rey says. She closes the panel and flips a rusted lever. Silence. So is there like an on button or a light in ignites within the machine, interrupting Finn? Listen, if this goes sideways, I just want to say... Rose starts. Finn interrupts her. Say what? And a column of light shoots out the hollow spire. C-3PO lurches as the ground vibrates. The column of light from the spire above connects with the kyber crystal below, and it glows. R2 wheels next to the column of light and projects a hologram message directly into the data stream. The light beam shoots up into the sky, visible for miles. The poor and downtrodden look up at the beacon, faces warmed by its light. Among them, Dade smiles, hopeful. And the light leaves Coruscant and connects to nearby planets. Hills rise above a dense layer of palm jungle. Atop one, a thousand-year-old receiver from the Old Republic. The light hits the receiver and disappears within. On another planet, an old copper machine consumes the light. The gears spin and whirl. Monitors come to life with a brash code. An ancient Bendu monk rises to his feet and looks at the sky. He's been waiting for this for a long time. The lights blink and flash as the machine decodes the data stream back into an image. Leia, elegant in her New Hope white clothes. Peasants in a breadline look up at the light hitting the receiver in the distance. Suddenly, a nearby R4 unit beeps wildly and projects the hologram of Leia. This is General Leia Organa of the Resistance. The receiver sends another beam of light at its core, angled on a different trajectory to the sky. The beacon of light leaves the Agora system and connects to Wavet, a light blue planet further in space. The workers look up at the light as it hits a receiver perched on a cliff overlooking the ocean. Suddenly, every droid in the yard simultaneously projects the hologram message of Leia. The time has come to forge a path to freedom. The forces of oppression have ruled the galaxy for far too long. The message continues to drive around multiple planets. We must join together and fight. Send your fastest ships, all your warriors. Our voices will not be silenced. We can no longer live in the shadow of the First Order. We must step into the light. On the eclipse... Leia stands on the bridge, watching the light connecting planets. A familiar of hope of resistance fighters join her, their eyes wide and hopeful. Back on Remnicor, Kylo Ren approaches his ship and feels the light in the sky. It's visible in the stars above. He moves to a rocky overlook, closes his eyes and concentrates. The rocks around him vibrate. The light in the sky halts, stopped by an immovable force. The light is frozen in place like a suspended laser blast, thrumming as pressure builds. Back in the Jedi Temple, the beam grows in intensity and the receiver begins to quake. Something's wrong, Rose says. Go, go! Finn and Rose run away as the device explodes. The light goes dark, the fire of revolution is extinguished, and Leia is overcome with an ominous feeling of loss. Back on Buggerdom, the holograms disappear and Ray's hopes turn to an alarm. We have to go. Get to the ship. What is it, Poe says. Ray is already moving, pushing through the crowd. Rose and Finn climb through the rubble, coughing on dust. You okay? Rose asks. They are suddenly surrounded by a trio of TIE fighters. Laser cannons aimed through the open arched windows. Come on, Finn says. Finn clips onto the zip wire and Rose grabs on. They zip away from the tower as the temple spire explodes behind them. In the courtyard below, R2-D2 and C-3PO hurry out of the collapsing temples, followed by a cloud of dust. 
Finn and Rose escape the fireball, but the TIE fighters turn and pursue them, blasting away. Rose draws her weapon and shoots at the enemy ships in midair. She shatters the front windshield of one, hitting the pilot, and it spins out and crashes. Rose is grazed by a laser blast and she screams in pain. Her zip line snaps as the temple crumbles and Rose falls into darkness. Rose! Finn yells. Finn swings into the open floor of an unfinished skyscraper and struggles to unhook himself. The TIE fighters hover around the skeletal structure on either side and fire into it. Finn runs for his life as the blasts ricochet off the steel griders all around him. He slides into a stairwell under heavy fire. Back on Bonadon, Ray crumbles, emotional, feeling Finn's pain. Finn, she says quietly to herself. Ray looks up at Poe, the crushing feeling of loss growing heavier, but Poe is looking at something behind her. A Tasker Wren, through the separating crowd. Ott and Lul Wren on either side, menacing amidst the carnival, lights and box lanterns. Ray rises, backing away from the oncoming knights of Wren. Okay, I'm with you, we gotta get to the ship, Poe says. She reaches for a lightsaber, but Poe stops her. Not here. Ray looks at the children and peasants in the market, and Poe's right. They can't take more casualties. Ray clenches her fist and force pushes everything around her. A powerful concussion that knocks away everything, including Poe. He flies off the edge of the market wall and plunges into the water below. Ray jumps onto the dock and unhooks a razor sail powered by a Dyson-like air cannon. Get on, she screams to Poe. Poe swims the boat ladder. Can you sail? Poe asks. Ray channels the force and fills the sail with a gust of wind that launches them into the bay. Poe and Ray speed across the bay towards the landing array. This boat is very fast. Something fires from above, exploding the water all around them. Ray looks up, and the knife nine speeds over the water towards them. Get to the bow cannon, I'll drive, Poe says. Poe takes the helm while Ray activates the laser harpoon mounted on the front. She blasts away at the Knife Nine while Poe steers them towards the Falcon's docking array. Inside the Knife Nine, Hataska Ren pilots with cold precision. Jadik, Ort, and Lol sit in the surrounding cockpit chairs. The Razor Sail now takes the fire from all sides. Ray thinks fast and turns the harpoon and shoots the sail cord. She reaches out to Poe. Hold on, she says, and Poe joins her and holds on tight. The disconnected sail lifts them up like parasailers onto the first revolving landing pad of the docking array, and the razor sail hits the straw and explodes. The knife nine banks away from the explosion but turns right around. They're not done yet. Chewbacca stands on the Millennium Falcon ramp, waiting by the ship. Chewie, we drew some attention, Poe says, and an adjacent landing pad low is into view, the knife nine resting on it. The four Knights of Ren stand ominously out front, their platform rising even with the Falcons. Ray activates her lightsaber and she turns to Poe. Stand back. Ray leaps into the air and lands on their landing pad, taking them all on, spinning and striking fast, outmatched but relentless. Poe and Chewie unload their blasters at Jadek, who deflects with skill while firing a pistol with one free hand. Ray fights her tasker, lightsaber versus darksaber. Then Force pushes him off the edge of the landing array. He falls 50 feet and lands on the next pad below. Ott and Lord stay on her, moving in coordination. An unseen hive communication keeps their deadly attacks in sync. Poe and Chewie can't get a shot in on Jadik. His blaster fires fast, fully automatic. Poe is grazed, he screams in pain. Ray hears Poe screams and it brings her with rage. She kicks Lord away, buying a moment on one of them with Ott. She slices through him, dropping him cold, and then spins around and lol, reaches out, and she force pulls him into her lightsaber, impaling him. A ghostly screech as her tasca returns, swinging wildly. Ray disconnects her double saber and blocks his strike. One saber still impaled in lol's chest, and the other one clenched with her tasca. Chewbacca peppers Jadik Ren with bow cast of fire, and Jadik struggles to deflect the shots while Chewbacca advances. He reaches Jadik, grabs him by the neck and hulls him off the landing pad. Then he lifts his bow cast and fires, hitting Jake deck midair like a clay pigeon. Hataska strikes at Ray. Brutal swings, his dark saber sparking when it hits the concrete. He grazes her. She drops her lightsaber and falls back, unarmed. Hataska stands over her, raises his dark saber for the kill. And when he does, Ray gets a good look at his mask and is suddenly overcome with a flashback. Dark figures in the rain, voices screaming, lightning flashes revealing Hataska Rem. She is then snaps back to reality. 
The vision stirs a deep, vengeful anger in Wei, one that she can't yet explain, but knows to be true. Hataska brings his saber down, but she extends her good hand, teeth clenched and eyes burning. Purple forced lightning flows from her fingertips, and Hataska's wren skulls flashing within the helmet as the electricity destroys him, and the body falls, smoking. Ray rises. Poe and Chewbacca are watching her, disturbed. I, I, I had no choice, Ray said. It's okay. Should I do that, right? Poe asks. Ray ignores the question. I've seen that mask before, all of them. Poe and Chewie head for the Falcon, but Ray does not follow. Ray, let's go, Poe says. No, you can't know where I'm going, Ray says. What are you talking about? This is the plan, Poe says. The Resistance needs you. Finn and Rose need you, Ray insists. Ray, get on the ship, please, Poe pleads. You have to leave this place, Ray says. I'm not leaving you, he replies. Ray knows what she has to do. She hates it. Ray raises up her hand. You will leave this place and go back to help the resistance. Poe pleads. I'm not. Don't do this. She approaches Poe. Delicately brushes her fingertips over his bleeding forehead. You will leave this place and go back to help the resistance. Chewbacca howls. Poe pleads again. No, you can't. But he feels his mind slipping away from him. Ray says one more time. You will leave this place and go back to help the resistance. Ray takes Poe's face in her hands and kisses him. When she pulls away, Poe looks distraught and saddened. Poe looks up. I have to leave this place. I have to help the resistance. And Poe turns and walks up the ramp. Chewbacca follows and BB-8 looks up at Ray, ever faithful. She's purposely cold. Go, she says. BB-8 beeps mournfully and follows them. Ray watches as the Falcon's ramp rises, obscuring Poe and Chewbacca from her sight. Strangely, as the ramp closes, Poe holds up her hand goodbye, his sentinels breaking through the mind trick. The Falcon rises into the sky, and Ray's robes whip in the wind. She enters the copy of the Knife Nine and places Nomi's hand-drawn map on the console. She rests her lightsaber on top of it. Her left hand is cut and bleeding, but she wraps it with the sash of her sari, then removes the civilian clothes to reveal the black warrior's clothing beneath. She catches her reflection in the mirror. A Jedi. The Knife Nine rises into the end, rockets into space. Back on Remnicor, Kylo Ren leaves the orbit of the planet in his TIE silencer, his mask taken off. A whole con transmission from Hux appears in his dash. Supreme Leader, the Resistance attempted to override the communications blockade. Do you know who really stopped them? Kylo asks. Hux's face betrays him. He didn't know. Such treachery cannot stand. We must respond swiftly, Hux says. Our empire is strong. Show them, Kylo orders. Your absence emboldens them. If you've acquired the power you seek, show it, Hux demands. Snoke was right about you, Hux. Without faith, you serve only yourself. And with that, Kylo shuts the holocom off and sets new coordinates in manually, and he blasts into light speed. Back on the eclipse... Leia looks out at the blue swirl of hyperspace. In the distance, Connix approaches her. General, we're approaching the rendezvous point. Leia makes a decision. Prepare an Imperial shuttle, only to valence code clearance, Leia says. Connix looks confused, but we're light years away from the... Yes, General. Connix exits, leaving Leia alone. She removes the general bars from her robe and pulls a hood over her head. He's in pain, Luke says. She responds to Luke as if he speaks to her often. I feel it too. Luke's force ghost steps forward at her side. He'll soon be more powerful than our father, Luke says as he also looks out at the hyperspace. So will she, Leia says. She feels too much love, anger, Luke responds. Don't we all? Leia says. This is why Jedi live in isolation. The pain of loss only leads them to the dark side, Luke says. I've lost everything and everyone, but I'm still going to choose love, Leia says. Leia regards her brother, missing him. Trust her instincts, she continues. She may not follow the path of the Jedi, but she's our only hope. Back on Coruscant, Finn sneaks out of the skyscraper, bleeding and disoriented. Voices echo, flashlights searching for him, and his bearings lost. Down the alley, the stormtroopers on 80 LTs, single rider walkers, scan the dark with floodlights, a small light up ahead. He ducks into a shadow. A stormtrooper, 
RK-514 approaches, scanning the tunnel with his blaster-mounted flashlight. Finn appears behind him and shoves a handheld device in the back of his neck and stuns him. The stormtrooper collapses and Finn confiscates his weapon and holds him at blaster point. Look at me, Finn says. The stormtrooper moans, half-conscious. Take off your helmet, Finn demands. The stormtrooper does so, disillusioned and vulnerable. What do you remember? How far back? Finn asks. Huh? RK responds. Do you remember when you were taken? Do you remember your parents? I, I, I don't know. Yeah, you do. You remember everything. Conditioning camp. Blind fires. It, it was tea training. That's what they tell you. Finn's face finds the lie and RK recognises him. You're him, the, the, the traitor. That's right, we're brothers, all of us, Finn responds. Finn tosses the stormtrooper's helmet out of reach. Give me your comlink. link. RK hands in the first order com. It's not what they said it was, would it? The things we were ordered to do. It's not right, Finn continues. You had a name once. Do you remember it? The stormtrooper shakes his head, no. Get a name, that's the first step, Finn said. Finn puts the blaster on his shoulder and kicks open a sewer grate. Then what, RK asks. Find something worth fighting for, Finn said. And with that he drops into the dark sewer, leaving RK-514 changed. Back in Hux's office, Hux stands over a prisoner strapped to a vertical torture rack. Rose. You comfortable? Hux asks. Yeah, I got one of these at home, Rose responds. Chancellor Hux walks around. You changed the Star Destroyer's signature code so we wouldn't trace it. Give me the new codes. You know, they told me to pick something easy to remember. Like Life Day, but I've forgotten what it is, Rose says. You think this is funny? Very well. Hux holds out his hand, shuts his eyes and concentrates deep. Are you... are you trying to use the force on me? Rose asks. Be quiet, Hux responds. Oh no... No, 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 see, you're not special. I mean at all, Rose taunts. Shut up! Huck shouts. He calms his fury and restrains himself. We have other ways to extract information. With that, a blast door opens to reveal an electronic torch device. New tech and built to work quickly. Rose braces for a more painful kind of defiance. Leia shuttle descends among plumes of earth-hued steam shooting up like skyscrapers from surface cracks. Aliens soak in sulfur baths, sweating from the steam. A trio of drunken First Order officers stumble down a side street to leave. Two hold up a blitz third singing. Sing how my mother sang it, one of the officers says. A white robed figure walks past them. We glimpse at Leia's face as she manoeuvres through the enemy's midst. She eyes an unmarked door, lit by a single lamp. When the coast is clear, she heads in. Classy, smoke-filled, Lampshades on every table, no customers left, and only alien servers cleaning up and cashing out. A Sloven band manager divides up credits between a pair of quad arm xenotodes at the two pianos on stage. The servers leave their nights, taken to be counted by the owner, Lando Calrissian, 70 years old and smooth as ever. Leia's shadow falls over the pile of credits. A man in his element, she remarks. Lando looks up and gives a big smile. Leia, she says. Lando is quickly on his feet and brings her hand to his lips. All right, all right, Leia says. The band manager eyes him from the stage. You shouldn't be here, Lando said. For your sake or mine, Leia asks. Both, he responds. He then pours a warm cup of tea. The clientele are, my most, are mostly first order, but what can I do for you? The grip of this empire is tighter than the last. Smuggling a man of life and death. I need your help, Leia says. Leia, Lando says, wary. We need ships, pilots, you know every smuggler in the galaxy, Leia said. Look, I promised Han I'd take care of you if something happened. Oh, you take care of me? Leia asks. I know, you deserve better, but helping your new friends crash into the First Order's machine isn't exactly what we would have wanted. Lando, the galaxy needs you, Leia said. Lando's eyes open off concern on the carpet floor, a trio of stormtroopers talking to the sleazy band manager they look up in Nando's direction. He takes Leia's hand and heads for a private elevator. Remind me never to make promises, Lando said. Lando brings Leia to her shuttle ready for departure. You need to go. I can't protect you here, Lando said. Come with me. Fight with us, Leia says. We won a war once already. What good did that do, L Lando responds. We proved it could be done, 
Leia said. Lando looks at Leia. Leia, I'd do anything for you. Lando puts a loving hand on Leia's cheek, leans forward and kisses her tenderly on the forehead. But I'm sorry. In the shuttle, Leia watches Lando grow small as, he sh as the shuttle flies away, his cape dusting behind him. Leia says to herself, Ray, help us. On the other side of the galaxy, Ray drops out of light speed to find herself in swirling clouds, half red, half blue, an ominous and violent atmosphere surrounding a black circle, the galactic void. Suddenly, the navigational system blinks out and the ship rattles, alarm sound. Ray braces herself and recalculates for light speed and makes a jump into the void. The stars streak into an infinite straight lines ahead and then twist and bends as she passes through the black hole. Ray faces an echo of herself, in 15 places at once, like the mirror on Acto. She then becomes surrounded by flashbacks, Finn taking her hand on Jakku, hand handing her her blaster on Takodana, Kyla reaching into her mind on Starkid Ablaze, Leia smiling fondly on her return to Dakar, Luke taking the lightsaber on Acto, Snoke snarling at her in the moments before his death, Poe yelling out her name on Bonadon, Hataska Ren's force electrified mask until it all stops. Ray opens her eyes. There is a planet ahead. No stars visible around it, only deep black. Heavy clouds swirl over one third of the planet. Another third is a rich green, and another is orange and red. Suddenly the power drops out, and the lights on the dashboard goes dark. The ship goes into a freefall. Knife Nine skims over treetops and crash lands in a riverbed. Tiny fish leap out of the water and run away. Ray prizes herself out of the wreckage and sloshes into land. She looks back at the smoking ship. No turning back now, she thinks to herself. She hikes into the leafy forest, summer turning to fall at an accelerated pace around her. The trees clear to a steep ledge, a towering mountain ahead, and a temple barely visible at the summit. The valley below is alive with orange, yellow, and red. She journeys on. On the other side of the planet, Kylo's silencer lands in a clearing of dead trees, no leaves on the branches and covered in snow. He looks up at the mountain ahead, the visibility is low. A natural stone bridge over a deep precipice. Tall granite on either side and vaguely shaped into primitive faces. It feels like a gate. A whisper on the wind swirls around him, fluttering his cape in the air. The force is strong here. He journeys on. Back on Coruscant, R2 and C-3PO emerge from an abandoned building. Two small figures followed by a desolate urban landscape. R2 beeps. I agree, R2. We may not survive this time, 3PO remarks. A shadow falls onto them both and a battalion of First Order transports descend into the mitts. They touch down, releasing an army of brute troopers. Thick, muscular mercenary forces, chrome armour and mask, reminiscent of Phasma. These guys make the stormtroopers look like the neighbourhood watch. The brute troopers bark orders flashing lights and weapons as families are forced from their homes. A horrified waist high Chandra found begs for mercy. Beak beak nat, the Chandra says. A brute trooper shoves his rifle into the alien's stomach, doubling over him. A trio of infants wail from their perch on the ceiling. A few nearby stormtroopers look at one another, disturbed by the violence. Next level vicious. The brute troopers push frightened citizens into prison crafts, and children are separated from their parents, herded into transports en route to the conditioning camps. They scream, reaching through the steel bars as the crafts rise. R2 and 3PO watch in horror as it plays around them. I can't watch, how horrible, 3PO says. R2 beeps mechanically. We'll never find Master Finn now, 3PO says. In the sewers, Sludge Water spurts out multiple shoots in a gluttonous sewer cake of repulsive, mysterious contents and Finn jets out of a chute and splashes down, uttering, Ugh. A pack of sewer romp rats feed on the refuse encased in the gluttonous mass. One approaches and sniffs, hideous whiskers brushing his face. Finn tries to dislodge his arms from the gel. Get away! Get, get, get away! He says. It takes a lick of his face before he can pull an arm out and swats it away. The romp rats scatter. There he sees why the rats have scattered. The colossal Gryok a whiteless lava the width of the tunnel is emerging from. It feeds on the sewage, gaping mouth slowly sucking the gluttonous mess into its body. Oh, no, 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 Finn says to himself. He dislodges himself enough to get stuck again. The gryot closes in, slow as the sludge as he sucks it in. This is the worst of bad nightmares. 
The Gryok's jaws open, drip in saliva, teeth like knives. Just as Finn is about to get eaten by this thing, a hatch opens above him, pouring light. It's Dade. Dade yells at him, give me your hand, and Finn grabs the kid's hand and pulls himself into the hatch just as the Gryok chomps down. Finn collapses, shaking and traumatised for life. That was so disgusting on so many levels. Dade turns around. I've seen worse. What's your name? Finn asks. Dade. Just one name? What's wrong with that, Finn? You know who I am? We've been tracking you since you landed, Dade says. Finn looks confused. We? He hears a distant screeching in the background. What was that? Dade looks. You don't want to find out. Come on. Dade shows Finn his resistance ring. Trust me. Finn follows Dade down a light tunnel, boots splashing in the shallow water and light up ahead. The First Order purged a 10 mile radius around the capital after the galaxy went dark. Took most of the bodies to conditioning camps, Dade said. Did anyone escape, Finn asked. Just us, Dade answered. Dade opens a rusty door to reveal hundreds of compartment-like dwelling units connected by catwalks to a control centre in the tower. Living here, a thousand escaped citizens, aged 12 to 60. Finn is stunned. How many people do you have down here? He asks. 10,000, maybe more, Dade responds. You have weapons, Finn asks. Whole city's got weapons. That's what they're afraid of. A million of us fight, rise up and the First Order's finished. Finn lets that idea burrow deep. You're right. This revolution starts here right now, Finn says. Sure, all we need is ships, weapons and an army, Dade says. Finn looks at the massive underground cavern of humanity, a thousand faces waiting for a leader. We have one, he says. Finn's eyes the old prison c command tower in the centre. He kicks open the door and fires up the con system. He looks down at the downtrodden faces. My name is Finn. I bring a message from the Resistance. The First Order rules by fear. They build ships to intimidate us and wear masks to frighten us. But they're the ones that are scared. This is not the time to hide underground. If we take the capital, the galaxy will join us. Together we can strike back and together we can resist. Hundreds and then thousands of people start clanking their possessions together in unison. Finn stands tall. From traitor to, to deserter... To revolutionary leader. His journey has led to this. Back on Mortis, Rey scales the icy peak blasted by wind and sleet. She reaches a plateau and finds her footing. There are statues of robed agents here, but they are not Jedi. A storm of snow dust obscures her vision and voices echo. Suddenly she's brought back to bright, warm sands of the Jakku Desert. The wind sweeps over the dune and a child voice screams out. Through the storm of sand, a little girl is dragged away from her mother and father. It's a young Ray, and at that moment, her parents abandoned her. The little girl screams, reaching out her hand. Come back, she yells. Ray steps towards them, feet digging into the sand. Wait, Ray thinks to herself. The mother breaks from the father's grasp and runs towards the young Ray, but the father holds her back. No, we can't. It's too dangerous, Ray's father says. The mother relents and calls to her daughter, heartbroken. Stay here. Wait for us. We'll come back. Understand? I promise we'll come back, Ray's mother says. The young Ray screams, and Ray's watery eyes match her younger self as the ship rises, casting a shadow over them both. The sandstorm kicks up, obscuring them, and it turns from yellow sand to snow. Ray catches her breath, devastated. They were afraid. Why were they afraid? She asks herself. No response, only wind. Luke, tell me, why were they afraid? He doesn't answer. She grows furious and screams. Her lightsaber flashes as she cuts an ancient statue in half. It falls, cracks in half. She looks at the temple above, anger burning in her eyes. On the other side of the planet, Carlo hikes through winter. Glimpses of the temples break through the canopy above. Suddenly, the wind dies. There's something ahead. A house in the woods, smoke from the chimney. His younger self, Ben Solo, approaches the house. He wears all black robes, a hood. This is clearly some kind of force-induced vision, a sign of this planet's strength. Kaido watches from the shadow as Ben nears the house. When he puts his hand on the iron door handle, it opens and Han Solo stands in the doorway. He looks at his son with sadness and fear. What are you doing, Ben? He asks. That's not my name anymore, Ben responds. Your mother can't see you here, not like that, Han says. Ben puts, pulls his hood down. He's maybe 17 years old. I'm not coming back. There's a greater destiny for me, Ben says. They're all lies, son. Empty promises. You have everything you need right here. Han begs. 
What, you, her? My master says I have unequal power. Neither of you can understand. Your mother understands more than anyone, Han says. She sent me away. To learn. To grow. I have grown. Kylo watches Han approach his son, strikingly similar to their confrontation on the catwalk of Stark at a base. Your mother loves you. She's afraid of me. And Han eyes the lightsaber in Kylo's hand. Give me the lightsaber, son. Han reaches for the lightsaber. You know I can't. Suddenly, we jump to the Starkiller base catwalk. Kylo is just moments just before he killed his father. He watches as he plunges the blade through Han Solo's heart, his father's eyes full of love even as the life drains from him. Kylo is disturbed and shaken, but once again in the mortis snow. Determined, he takes his first steps up the mountain. Back on the Coruscant streets, R2 and C-3PO emerge from a side street. Two small figures swallowed by the desolate urban landscape, and R2 beeps. I agree, this isn't the Coruscant I remember, Fubio responds. A shadow falls over them both, and a towering 80 empty walker rounds into the boulevard. They watch it pass, dwarfed by it. It stops. A smoking charred first order tank in its path. 3PO and R2 look on, curious. Inside the cockpit, the ATMT pilots look down at the burning tank. Any life forms? The first one asks. Nope. The other one responds. In the abandoned building, Finn and a hundred people's resistance fighters hunker down inside this empty building. The ATMT's head is positioned just below them outside. Finn pulls out his comp. Now. And the floor mounted grappling guns fire hooks that sticks into the opposite building, creating several zip lines over the MT. Finn clips on a car burner, and twenty resistance fighters swing into the ATMT like pirates boarding a ship. Finn drops on top of the ATMT's body, and dozens more land around him. They run along the back of his head. A resistance fighter cuts through the hatch with a vibra saw, and Finn tosses a thermal detonator inside. Clear, he yells. An electric flash within. The pilots swamp over the controls. Finn drops in and pushes the pilots aside, taking the helm. A familiar alien, six eyes, takes the co-pilot seat. Load up! And so do the panels of the walker open allowing the resistance fighters to rapple into the cavity. More armed citizens pour out of the alleys to escort the steel beast as it walks down the boulevard, knocking aside the flip tank in the process. A pair of tie choppers zip around the corner and square off against the ATMT, and the walker very simply blasts them out of the sky. In his office, Hux paces. In the next room, he hears the screams of Rose in pain, between electric jabs and shocks. That's when Selick enters. Chancellor, there's been an insurrection. Word has spread to the other districts. Decimate them, Huck says. Sir, Selick pauses. The leader is former FN unit. He was aided by a regiment of his own. Hux twitches. Impossible, Huck says. We're dispatching additional units to address the revolt. No, no, recall the FN units from active duty immediately, Huck says. Sir, Selick asks. If there is a flaw in their programming, we must correct it. Deploy the brute troopers, Huck says. Those mercenaries are undisciplined and expensive, Selick warns. Perhaps money is all that inspires loyalty anymore. Do it, he commands. Rose's eyes are sunken, clothes ripped, blood peeking through the torn fabric. She hears the commotion and the barking of orders. Two officers enter in a hurry. Transfer to cell block 6. They want her in maximum security, the officers order. One officer releases her from the rack and she slumps forward, dead weight. They drag her towards the door. As they move, Rose opens her eyes, eyeing the electric taser on the officer's hilt. When they reach the door, she hits the lights. She grabs the taser and shocks them both, clamps both of their wrists together in the iron shackles. So long, boys, she says, and she shuts the door behind her, leaving the two unconscious officers in there alone. The ATMT then turns the corner onto the Imperial Boulevard, and inside, Finn stokes revolt via a loudspeaker. We will no longer live in silence. Gather your weapons and rise up and strike back. Finn squints out the window in a gold droid wandering among the cheering revolutions. Unsure how he gets there. 3PO? Finn climbs out of the ATMT for a better look. Suddenly, he's yanked upwards and a brute trooper lifts him out of the hatch and throws him into the back of the walker. Finn is locked in a fist fight on the back of a moving walker 50 feet off the ground. Finn takes brutal hits from the brute trooper's steel gloves and it's like fighting a medieval knight with his bare hands. A powerful tackle, and they both roll off the edge of the moving walker. Bang! 
They land right on the brooch of his back, but he keeps fighting unharmed. Finn spots the walker's foot coming down on them, and they roll away just as it lands. The brood trooper grabs a fallen blaster and puts a heavy fit on his chest, aiming for Finn's heart. Any last words, FN2187? Suddenly, laser fire takes him out. Finn looks up and a unit of stormtroopers. The leader takes off his helmet and extends his hand. It's RK514. He lifts Finn to his feet and hands him a blaster. Rafe, he says. I like it, Finn responds. The other stormtroopers take off their helmets and throw them aside. Diverse faces with a new purpose. Freedom. Back on the Eclipse Destroyer, Conic escorts Leia to a terminal. This message from the First Order transmitter, Finn is alive and he has an army ready to storm the capital. They need reinforcements. Leia turns. All we have is what's on the ship. We can't win a war with a hundred pilots. A hundred plus one, Poe responds. Chewbacca stands behind him growling. Sorry, Chewie. He's right, plus two, Poe continues. BB-8 beeps. Okay, I get it, plus three. Leia's face falls from relief to dread. Where's Rey? She went on alone. Her choice, not mine. What about the others? We lost contact with Rose, they responded. Finn is alive and he's on the ground, but he says he needs reinforcements. Then we put our pilots in the sky and back him up, Poe says. What? Isn't this what we've been fighting for? If we can take the capital, we can destroy the jammer and call the galaxy to war, Poe responds. Leia looks so mournful. They'll kill millions. I've seen it, it's too reckless. Poe gets angry. Resistance is reckless. Passion is the greatest weapon we have. Poe appeals to Leia. Their history together laid bare. The rebels fought the Empire and won. You showed us what it, that it could be done. But that was your war. This one is ours. Let us fight it. Leia looks at the Resistance fleet, young and ready. Set a course for Coruscant. Ready your weapons and attack ships. This is a full assault. Resistance soldiers load into their transport. Pilots lower their joys into place. Urban assault vehicles roll into the open cargo holds of massive heavy transports. And the Eclipse tacks towards a distant point and the hyperdrive fires, rocketing the massive craft into deep space. Back on Mortis, Kylo Ren ascends the steps to a sealed stone door. The temple is cut into the mountaintop. Uninterritable, carvings, runs and statues allude to civilization of knowledge long lost. He reaches out, and the door bends to his will and opens. A millennium of dust spills from its cracks, but he does not enter. He knows he's not alone. I knew you'd come. Kylo turns to face Rey. His mask surprises her. She's only seen the protection of his ideal self in their connections, not this. The force is strong in this place. Can you feel it? Kylo says. A low rumble. She's digging into his mind. You're in pain beneath that mask, Rey says. Get out of my head. You won't like what you find. He force pushes her back. Her feet slide back a few inches, but she withstands it, steadfast. I'm stronger than Anakin Skywalker, and stronger than his son, Kylo continues. But you're still afraid, Ray says. Of what? You? Kylo asks. Of what you've become. The dark side has left you empty, alone. I don't have to be alone. With the power of this place, we can rule the galaxy as the ancients did. The light side and the dark. You still think I'd join you, after what you did to my family? Kylo falters a bit. Were well, you going to tell me the truth, here? We can meet with the truth? I know what you did. Deep down, I've always known. She circles him like a lion. My parents didn't sell me for drinking money. They were hiding me from you. Kylo nods. So you remember. Flashback. The Knights of Ren in the Rain. The image from Ray's force vision when she first touched the lightsaber. Snoke made his orders clear. Find anyone who could destroy him. Didn't take us long to find you. You killed my parents. You blame me for your life on Jakku? You should thank me for it. You were safe, Carlo said. Say it. Did you kill them? Ray demanded. Carlo nodded. I did. And a blast of powerful energy explodes around her. Clearing the temple mount of loose rocks. You murdered Han Solo, she said. I'm not here for you, Ray, Kyla responded. Millions of people, Ray said. All I want is what's behind that door. Ray ignites her dual lightsaber. Then you'll have to kill me. Kylo lights his own saber. I know. And Kylo attacks. They clash on the steps of the temple. Both far more powerful than the last time they met. But they know that one of these two will not survive. Back on Coruscant, the Eclipse appears from light speed. 
the city grows beneath. First Order Sentinel ships protect the capital from space. Leia spins around on her chair, once occupied by Akbar. Send the fleet to Planetfall. Surprise is the only advantage we have, Leia said. X-Wings and Razorcraft fighters speed out of the bay, followed by troop transports and cargo dropships. Poe races towards the Falcon, with Chewbacca and BB-8 following right behind him. No, we don't have enough pilots. Get out there and do some damage, Poe said. Chewbacca roars. Poe po turns to him. I don't know. Pick one. Chewie looks around and spots an orange X-Wing. He cocks his head. Hux enters the command deck, overlooking the boulevard. Smoke rises from the buildings. Chancellor, we've detected a ship in orbit. One of ours, but with unrecognised signature codes, Salek said. It's the stolen eclipse. Someone all destroys the capital. We have to end this rising here and now and eliminate the resistance on this one triumphant day. The Millennium Falcon rockets out of the bay and joins the resistance attack fleet. The Sentinels unleashed hell assisted by a squadron of TIE fighters launching from within. Poe is indented with blasts from the larger ships. A trio of hunters bear down on the Falcon, then explode in succession. Chewbacca's X-Wing zips overhead, eliminating the enemy ships with precise focus shots. He wears no helmet in his cockpit. He roars, and BB-8 chirps from the droid socket. Poe raises his eyebrows and impressed. That's one hell of a pilot, he says to himself. The Eclipse unloads a super laser on the Sentinels. They explode as our, as our attack fighters and transport descend through the billowing fire to planet full. The ATMT down on the planet foot stomps down the boulevard towards the First Order capital. The new resistance army moves with it. Thousands now, some with new blasters, others with nothing but clubs and passion. Finn marches out front with Rafe and his rebel troopers. Dave rides out the top hatch of the a head of the ATMT, speaking through the booming speaker. Rise up, join the fight! Small bands of revolutionaries appear from the side alleys. A trickle building to a stream, building to a river. But a distant sound silences them. Lock set boots. And a thousand riot suppressing Mandalorian brute troopers, bulky armoured mercenaries with heavy shields and arm cannons march towards them. Sign cuts through the fog, revealing the extent of the capital's defences. Advanced tanks and walkers, new designs that we've never seen before. Finn holds the line at the sight of the oncoming forces. Stand your ground, he yells. Back with R2 and C-3PO, they walk through the laser fire, when they see a First Order astromech droid rolling to a scomp terminal on the other side of a flip tank. They plug in. R2 beeps urgently. He's sending a distress signal. Stop him. No one listens to C-3PO, and R2 continues to beep furiously. Me? I'm not programmed for violence, R2. Bleep. C-3PO steals himself. Hustles through laser fire and rips, rips open the back panel of the R8. I do apologise for this. He reaches into the droid's innards and pulls his circuits out. An R8 beeps in distress, adding to the 3PO's horror. Please go quietly, he pleads. One last jank and the R8 sparks out. Tips hit in the ground. R2 agree, plugs into the scomp link, sends his own command, and the belly rail gun stops, spins and resets and fires on the brute troopers. Finn climbs onto the flip tank, past 3PO, who frets over the inanimate shell of R808. Oh, I've done some horrible things, I may never be the same again. And shadows glide over the long boulevard. A squadron of TIE fighters crater the boulevard ahead of them. Gases of concrete spew up, they're about to be decimated when a fleet of X-Wings and B-Wings dive from the sky. The resistance ship flies through the trench buildings and hammer the bombers, spinning them into explosive collisions. Finn, Rafe and the Stormtroopers cheer the skies. Resistance transports on the boulevard behind them. Stolen First Order AT-80s, ATSTs, and attack speeders emerge from the cargo doors. They are heavily modified and painted with revolutionary colours, eyes and teeth. The Resistance troops pour out the landing transports. You feel that? Finn swells with hope. We are the Resistance, all of us. Back on Mortis, rain pours the ground stone, lit by flashes of blue and red. The lightsabers of Rey and Kylo fight mercilessly on the steps of the temple. Ancient statues crumble around them. Rey stops one mid-air and pushes them back. I could have been your teacher, Kylo said. Rey loses ground and doubts herself, stumbling a bit. I could have ended your pain, Kylo continued. At that moment, Rey slices Kylo's mask off, shearing the bottom right half clean off, revealing the flesh beneath. He removes the rest of his mask. Eye to eye now, she parries and attacks. You're weakening, he said. Kylo allows Rey's barrage to hammer him, taking careful, controlled counter-strikes through her wild assaults. 
the last glimmer of a dying light. Kylo strikes a wicked blow across her face that instantly cauterizes a scar from her left cheek to her forehead. Ray's lightsaber drops to the stone. She falls to her knees and screams, clutching her eyes. When she opens them, the world is an abstract blur of light. She's blinded. Kylo stands over her, lightsaber pointed to her heart. Ray looks up, crying blood. Ray falls backwards down the stone steps, motionless. Goodbye, scavenger, he says. Kylo enters the temple, leaving Rey blind and bleeding on the steps. Back on Coruscant, the Falcon buzzes the surface of the Eclipse, picking off attackers. Chewbacca's X-Wing flies right with it. A finalizer Star Destroyer arrives from hyperspace and fires on the Eclipse, hitting the deflector shields. Leia swivels in her chair, conducting the revolution. Engage starboard cannons, she orders. Gun ports on the side of Eclipse open, pushing out 20 massive iron cannons like a pirate ship. They fire in unison. The finalizer stutters from the barrage and explodes. Leia clenches her fist among cheers of victory. Ten more Star Destroyers suddenly arrive at once, an armada of sizes and classes. Leia's confidence begins to drain. Come about, she orders. The Eclipse turns on its axis and unleashes hell. The, laser, the lasers light up fire like dark on Christmas. The First Order destroyers fire back faster and more propulsive than we're used to. Their relative scale to the Eclipse let us feel their speed for the first time. The Resistance ships weave and glide between buildings on Coruscant, firing on TIE Hunters at window level of the profiteers who finance this conflict. A tight squadron re reaches the capital itself, and their leader, Elo Asti, sends a pair of homing missiles into the structure. They hit big. Iron cannons on motorised swivels rise up from the structure's roof, blasting ships out of the sky with deadly precision. Chancellor Hux watches a holographic representation of the air battle. How is this not over? he demands. It's a stolen dreadnought, sir. Our fleet isn't equipped to engage this ship of that magnitude, Selick responds. I mean all of it, he demands. Boom, an explosion rocks the capital, flickering the lights. Rose sneaks through the crisp white hallways and ducks into a recess, a procession approaching. Commander Selick in the centre of it. Ready the hyperdrive, Selick demands. Rose holds up a grass. The capital is a ship. In the unlikely event our defences are breached, we'll make the jump to light speed. Selick continues. She watches the First Order text break away. They scan the ID bars on their uniforms and disappear through a door. Rose sneaks to a window overlooking a vast architectic abyss encircling the spine of the capital. Attached to the spine like a vertebra, the cube transmission jammer, completely encased in armour with no bridges or access points, she can't reach it. Removes those confiscated ID bars from a hidden pocket. She scans the door and it opens. Rose creeps into the control room, stacked with nav consoles. Prepare for search and disengagement. Ready engines for hyperspace. Purely precautionary, a first order tech orders. She slips through behind the consoles and opens a panel on the floor. She crawls into the subspace between the control room, surrounded by the wired computer towers that power the hyperdrive. The techs are still audible above. Ready to set coordinates, sir, a tech responds. Plot a course for the fourth system, another tech says. Rose opens a panel to the hyperdrive's computer motherboard and gets to work. Back in the Millennium Falcon, Poe zips between a pair of burning destroyers as they collide behind him, swarming ties and chaos outside his cockpit. Chewie, you've got to get down there. They need you. I've got this under control. He doesn't have it under control. BB-8 begins to freak frantically and Chewbacca rolls. He then spins and dives, breaking into the atmosphere. His X-Wing descends to the capital, weaving through the grid of laser fire upwards by the iron cannons. He makes an attack run over the cannon arrays, taking out several turrets with one continuous dizzying display of badassery. <laughs> Alarm warnings, multiple lock-ons, and TIE fighters swarm around Chewie, ganging up. BB-8 chirps, concerned. Chewie wars, also concerned. They get hit, and Chewie's manoeuvres over the monument square start spinning them into a dive. The orange X-Wing makes a distressed landing, knocking over brute troops in its path as it comes to a screeching stop. Save that pilot, Finn orders. Finn and his squad blasts make their way to the crashed ship. He climbs onto the wing and BB-8 freaks, beeps frantically. BB-8? Finn asks, and the cockpit opens with Chewbacca warring. Chewie, where'd you learn to fly like that? Chewbacca looks at him. He roars, and the roar meaning before you were born. Rafe then stands up and warns Finn, incoming, and a fresh batch of heavy ATMTs emerge. Cannon fire rains down from the capital above. 
this revolution may not last long. Back on the bridge of the eclipse, Leia is wary but steadfast. Change our plan of attack. Don't let them line up on us like this. Connix interrupts urgently. General, our agent on the inside is contacting you. We have an agent on the inside? Leia asks, and Connix activates her comm speaker. The capital is a ship, Rose yells. Rose, slow down, Leia says. Rose is patched into a comm terminal, sparks falling around her, hot wired cables string between CPU towers. They're going to leave the planet. I can disable the hyperdrive, but I need the key codes in Artu's memory drive. Leia looks worrisome. Artu's with Finn. Patch her through, Connix. Rose lights up. Finn's alive? Finn takes a moment to hide behind a fallen ATSC and yells into his comm. Rose, you're alive! Stay where you are, we're coming for you. Rose rolls her eyes, since, as usual, she's about to save everyone's ass. Great, now listen carefully. I need R2 to transfer me the hyperdrive keys before this thing takes off. Hyperdrive? Finn asks. Where are you? There's a scomp link terminal at the base of the capital. I'll have a direct connection to him from there. Got it? Finn looks around frantically. R2, come here. He spots 3P and R2 behind a flip tank and races towards them. He grabs R2. We need to get you to the capital. Master Finn, we're more suited for rear unit duty, 3PO responds. Finn looks at the battlefield, eyeing the path to the base terminal. First order transports touch down ahead. Even more dro brute troopers spill into the square. None of this matters if we don't reach that terminal, Finn said. R2 beeps determined. For glory? What are you saying, R2? There are no glory in droids, 3PO responds. Then suddenly, R2 takes a direct hit from a cannon blast. He hits the side of the tank and falls hard. No squeal. He's silent and scorched black, unmoving. R2? R2! 3PO says we're assembly. Finn runs over to Chewie. Cover us! He hunkers over R2. Chewbacca stands tall, firing away. R2? R2, say something! 3PO says. Finn waves smoke away from R2's burnt body. The droid circuits are dead, no power. Those codes are in here somewhere. Finn opens a panel and removes R2's memory drive. I'm sorry, buddy. He pulls it out. BB-8! BB-8 rolls up and ready for duty, and Finn opens a compartment in the droid's round body and inserts R2's memory drive. It's all up to you now, okay? Rose, send BB-8 the terminal coordinates. He's got this. You got this, right? BB-8 nods. Silent, focused, but his moment. Finn turns around. Cover fire! Finn, Chewbacca, and the Stormtroopers cover BB-8 as best as they can. He dashes into battle. BB-8 runs right through the entire scene, tracking past him a barrage of explosions and laser blasts, th though moving through the ATMT's legs, narrowly missing craters and fallen brute troopers. Finn watches the little guy from afar, inspired. He looks around at the res wounded resistance, cut off and surrounded fighting for survival. And then suddenly an explosion knocks Finn off his feet, ears ringing. Fall back, Rafe shouts. Finn yells at C-3PO, still leaning over R2's fallen body. 3PO, we have to move. C-3PO looks up, hand on R2's scorched head, emotion like we've never seen from him. I can't leave him, he says. Finn is speechless, crushed by it all. Chewbacca reaches down and heaves R2's scorched shell up on his own back. He howls. With, uh, with one arm blasting and the other one securing R2, Finn and him race towards cover. Chewbacca gets hit, stumbles, but keeps going. He's hit again. He falls to one knee and almost drops R2. Finn's eyes tear up as they fire back at impossible odds. This is how it ends. Poe watches enemy ships slip through their air, strafing attack formations and defend, descend towards Coruscant. We'll have no chance down there if these reinforcements keep getting through. We need more ships. On the bridge, another Star Destroyer appears from hyperspace, and another... Leia watches the numbers shift even more out of favour. Luke, I'm sorry. Back on Mortis, Kylo Ren's long shadow precedes him in the cavern of the stone. Statues of the ancients look down into a deep void in the centre, sealed with a slab of unpolished marble. Kylo reaches out. The stone slab slides off and falls to the ground with a thud. He looks down into the well beneath the temple, deep into the heart of Mortis, eager for his reward. It's empty. Nothing. A hole in the ground. No. No, Kylo says to himself. Kylo searches the rune-covered walls for answers. He finds only arcane sculpted faces looking down at him. He fires his saber and slashes at the statue, scarring the ancients with his rage. 
You've lost, Ben, Luke says. Luke steps into the light. A thin blue glow traces his form. You're dead! The Jedi are ghosts, Kylo yells. The dark side has failed you like it failed my father. Your father was weak, Kylo said. His love for his family saved him. I wish it could save you, Luke said. Luke looks deeper into his former student's pained eyes. I did what I had to do, Kylo said. You choose hate, Luke replied. I chose power. Kylo fires his saber and attacks, but Luke catches the blade with his gloved hand, stopping it mid-air, stronger than Kylo could possibly imagine. I'll be stronger than any Skywalker there has ever been. Their faces are inches away, separated by a red blade. You are no Skywalker, Luke said. Outside the temple, Rey lies motionless on the steps, blind and bleeding in the rain. Then her hand moves towards the air. Her eyes flutter open. Luke, she says. Back in the temple, Luke's expressions change, sensing her. Let go, Kylo. You can't defeat us. Kylo raised an eyebrow. Us? Luke looked at Kylo and nodded. I am not alone. Obi-Wan was right. Outside the temple, Rey drags her shattered body up the temple steps. Her arm gives out and she collapses. The pain is too much. We're all connected. All living things, Luke says. Back at the bridge of the eclipse, Leia looks beyond the battle, feeling Rey's pain. Rey, she says. Luke turns around. The force surrounds us. Rose winces from a spark as she rewires the hyperdrive on the capital. Fingertips bleeding. She looks up. A feeling. It penetrates us, Luke says. On the Millennium Falcon, Poe flies through a barrage of laser fire. It binds the galaxy together. Poe feels the connection from across the galaxy. Ray. Back outside the temple, Ray looks into the rain. Poe. Finn. She begins to gather her strength. Finn is now crouched low behind cover, laser flying overhead. We are one, bound by the force, Luke continues. Finn feels the connection, a surge of hope. Fight, Ray, fight, he says. Ray hears him. He's there with her, they all are. They all bound together. Fight, they say as a distant echo. Luke gives his former student a faint smile. We will not be broken. With all of her strength, the last Jedi rises. She unwraps a strip of cloth from the bandage on her hand and uses it as a blindfold. At that point, Luke vanishes. And beyond him, Ray stands tall in the arched doorway, blind, bruised and determined. Our masters were wrong. I will not deny my anger and I will not reject my love. A fallen lightsaber flies into her hand. I am the darkness and I am the light. Kylo looks up. You are nothing and you are no one. She ignites the blade and they crackle. No one is no one. Kylo charges. Their blades meet and sizzle. Rey fights him blindfolded and guided by the force. Back on the eclipse, the burning resistant cruisers plummet to the landfall. Leia watches the fiery carnage out of her observation window. It's over. Connex calls to Leia. More ships from the outer ring, General. Leia, Leia turns around sadly, prepared to retreat. Connex shakes her head. General, these aren't First Order ships. Leia looks out the starfield ahead, and off her surprise, a thousand ships appear from hyperspace. A massive fleet of smugglers and thieves flying tricked out junkyard bound personal cruisers. The pirates Han Solo spent half his life running from. And in the lead is Lando's personal starship, the Lady Luck. Lando helms at the controls. Thought you could use a few scoundrels, General. Nye Nylin, an aging alien in a vintage bomber jacket, shakes his head at the co pilot's chair. I'm too old for this, he says to himself. Lando's ragtag fleet attacks come for the large battlements as they lay waste the enemy. On the Coruscant Boulevard, a burning TIE fighter crashes into the army of brute troopers and tanks in the square. Finn looks up. A battalion of ships he's never seen join the firefight. What? Yes! He raises his rifle in the air and yelling to all who can hear him. Chewie, we've got company! He shouts out. At the capital base, BB-8 reaches and plugs into the terminal. Rose receives the feed of her hacked CPU tower, and the panel lights up with a flood of key codes. boy," she says. The First Order fleet begins to take a beating. First Order ships are in retreat. Send more ships to the capital, Connix yells. Poe, get down there, Leia says. Poe steers the Millennium Falcon into a steep descent. 
copy that, he says to himself. The Falcon starts one long descent from space into city. Poe takes out the TIE fighters as he goes, firing the Falcon's forward cannon until they jam dry. The ship dives into the canyon of buildings, levelling out a trajectory towards the legion of ATMTs on the boulevard. The Falcon buzzes over the heads of Poe and Chewbacca and crashes through the legs of the walkers, cutting the mechanical beasts off at the knees, toppling them all as they spark out into Monument Square. The ship grinds to a stop at the base of the capital. The accumulated pile of fallen walkers and crash ships create a barricade on the front steps. Alarms blare. Commanding officers frantically prepare for departure. Hux eyes the crashed falcon in the squares below. Bomb the city! Decimate every last being, he orders. Our forces are outnumbered, sir, Selick said. Hux realised the tragic truth. he just lost the Star Wars. He storms into the lush chamber. He walks over to the collector's case and removes one of his prized vintage lightsabers. He activates it and impales himself with a purple blade. Hux kneels, the glowing saber protruding from his chest as the first order ships descend in smoke and fire out the window. The battle is won. Back at the Temple of Mortis, Kylo counters Rey with every move. They are evenly matched. Two sides of a coin, flame and shadow, fighting to the death. A vicious swing and Kylo's lightsaber shatters at the hilt, destroyed, among with several fingers of his hand, cut across his palm. He looks at it with disbelief, stumbles back towards the empty well of Mortis and falling to one knee. Rey stands over him, anger flowing. She separates her dual lightsaber, holds one blade pointed to Kylo's chest. Kylo is stunned by the powerful being before him. She's almost glowing, unfathomable living force with him. He clenches his teeth, his eyes furious. A rage we haven't seen since Anakin, and he reaches out the palm of his one good hand and extracts the living force from Rey as Torval and taught him. She rises, energy flowing from her body in Kylo's hand as the life drains from her. She pulls her blindfold off and screams to the sky. Kylo stands tall, energized. His face has his face has returned to normal, healed. He pulls the iron plates off his skin and they fall away, healthy flesh underneath. He looks beyond way to the empty world of Mortis. They were wrong, all of them. The power of this place can't be taken. Ray looks down. Ben! Kylo. Kylo looks up at Ray. But it's nothing compared to you. Kylo takes more from her. Ray is almost gone, drained of life. She summons all of her strength and reaches out. And with the last of herself, she offers him a hand. Ben! Please! Back on the bridge, Leia feels the disturbance. It pains her. Into the vastness of space, she says her son's name. Ben. Carlo hears his mother's voice. He stops, feeling her close. Leia continues, Ben, come home. Then something happens to Carlo when he hears his mother's voice. Leia, pleads, help us. Carlo feels the very thing that destroyed Anakin, but doesn't make him feel weak. He looks at Ray's outstretched hand and takes it. The living force flows back into her. Both light and dark swell within Ray as Carlo is reduced to an empty shell a man without power, a frightened boy. Kylo and Rey collapse into one another, each popping the other up on their knees. Rey is close to him now, their foreheads touching. He is weakened, spent in the last moments of his life. Kylo looks up. Salona. Rey is stunned to hear that name, distant like a memory. Your name. Rey Salona. Those words are Ben Solo's last. Rey watches the light dim in his eyes. But it is the light. Goodbye, Ben, she says. And with a look that could be perceived as love, Ben Solo dies. Ray releases her hold, collapses, barely alive herself. They fought to the death. Back on Coruscant, Finn appears through the smoke, bloodstained, dirty, a hero. Ray from the other renegade stormtroopers behind him. Poe climbs out of the Falcon's cockpit and Chewbacca helps him. Finn regards his old friend, amazed at his transformation. He spots a fallen resistance flag on the ground, picks it up and hands it to Finn. Finn takes the flag, climbs up on the angled bow of the crashed midnight oiler to the top of the barricade of the ships. Poe and Chewbacca scale it with him. Finn waves the flag for all to see. The ground shakes. They all look up as the First Order capital leaves its moorings. Poe looks up. Everyone get back! And a thunderous boom as the capital rises into the sky. Finn looks up. Rose is still in there! Finn spots BB-8 rolling towards them from the quaking base. BB-8, where is she? In the capital, at the escape pods, Rose races through the quaking capital, 
checks a hand-drawn map on her hand and round a corner towards a bay of escape pods. She climbs in one and shuts the door. It launches as the capital rises, a short trip before it crash lands into the battlefield. Commander Selick looks at the shrinking metropolis below. The massive structure casts a shadow over the city. Prepare for light speed, he says. Finn rushes to Rose's escape pod. Rose, are you okay? He touches her hand affectionately. I'm fine, she says. She looks up at the rising capital, backlit against the setting sun. Poe, Chewbacca, BB and C-3PO follow her eyes. They're getting away, C-3PO says. Did you disable the hyperdrive, Finn asks. I couldn't figure it out, Rose says. Hope falls away. The war is lost. So I have made some adjustments to their navi computer. Without precise calculations, that thing could... The capital jumps to light speed. The moment it vanishes, it explodes, colliding with a distant planet. The impact is so massive, so galaxy-shaking, it is visible for light years. Fly right into a star, Rose continues. On the bridge of the eclipse, Leia shields her eyes as the enormous explosion in deep space pulsating in the starry twilight, a beacon of hope. Radio communications instantly crackle to life. A caponi of voices fill the frequency air, calling on their brethren to fight. Finn, Poe, Rose, Chewie, and all the droids all look up, awed, inspired, but they can't celebrate, not yet. They all look at Finn, speaking volumes. You feel it too. Poe nods, affirming their connection. Ray is gone. Ray lies flat on the stone. Silence. Light fills up the space around her. Particles of energy floating up. She rises with them. The light engulfs the flame until we reach a place beyond what we know. The astral plane. Glimmers of energy flicker like fireflies in darkness. Ray opens her eyes, clear again, unburdened. Three of the distant glimmers grow larger than the others. She moves towards them. Yoda, Luke Skywalker, and Obi-Wan Kenobi. Is this death? Ray asks. In this place, there is no such thing as death, Obi-Wan responds. I can see, Ray says. Your true self is free of suffering, free of pain, Obi-Wan responds. Taught us much you have. Yoda says. I've taught you? Mmm. Succeeded where we have failed. Narrow was our point of view. You chose to embrace the dark side and the light, to find the balance within, Luke responds. Coexist they must, as much feelings do in all of us. But if I'm here with you, Ray asks, a choice you must make, to return or to remain, Yoda states. Here there is serenity, knowledge, peace, those lost but not forgotten, Luke says. She looks beyond them at the shimmering flecks of energy. And there? She asks. There you will face a galaxy in turmoil, pain and suffering, the loss of those you love, Obi-Wan remarks. But living you will be. Loved you shall, Yoda says. On Rey's face, she, we see her considering the life she's yet to live and makes her decision. Thank you, she says. The spirits fade into the cosmic force. As the light overwhelms us, Obi-Wan's Obi voice echoes, You are a Jedi, Ray Salona, but you will not be the last. Back on Coruscant, a resistance flag rises from the rubble at the sight of the old capital. Thousands of citizens fill the square, free. Heroes at attention, Leia, Skywalker, Organa, in elegant white, with Lando Calrissian and her top generals around her. Finn, Rose, Poe and Chewie stand before Leia. She places medals of honour around each of their necks. BB-8 bleeps excitedly at their feet. After 40 years of service, Chewie gets a medal. Leia looks down at the blue beacon bracelet once used to guide Rey back to safety, clenched tight in her hand. Finn and Rose stand by her side. I can't feel her presence, she says. Finn bows his head. Neither can we. But there is calm that I've never felt. Balance, Leia continued. Then that's her, Finn said. Rose looks up. Come on, we have work to do. Leia approaches Poe and Chewbacca. Also on their way, she places the beacon bracelet in Poe's hand. I'll never stop looking for her, Poe said. Chewbacca gives her a giant Wookiee hug. Finn approaches Poe, holding something under his arm. Let me know what you find, Finn says. I will, Poe replies. And Finn hands Poe his old leather jacket. For good luck, Finn smiled. Poe takes it, hugs him, and Chewbacca growls. We follow Poe and Chewie to the Millennium Falcon, rebuilt to look better than it has in decades. Poe flips the switches in the console. He takes Ray's beacon and hangs it, replacing Han's dice. Leia watches from her window as the Falcon jets off into the starfield. The Phantom Hawk rockets the other way into empty space. 
Leia checks R2-D2, still under construction, a repair droid working on him, rebuilding his destroyed frame. How else are you coming? Leia asks. C-3PO nods. A quick cycle through his memory banks and he'll be his old self again. He'll be fine, 3 po Leia said. I can't imagine what I'd do without him. I know he's stubborn, but I... I... Leia interrupts him. I know. Leia picks up R2-D2's memory drive, rescued by BB-8, and inserts it into R2, reminiscent of the first time we saw the princess with the droid. R2 beeps to life. As his files catalogue in chronological order, he projects the contents of his memory bank, and we witness their adventures over 60 years, all from the droid's perspective. Luke buying C-3PO from the Jawas, Obi-Wan giving Luke his lightsaber, R2 flying through the Death Star, Han getting his medal, Yoda lifting the X-Wing, Luke saluting from the plank on Jabba's barge, Leia and Han outside the bunker on Endor. Leia is taken back by the flood of memories. It is hard for her. She takes a deep breath. Thank you, R2, she says. Leia leaves them alone together, and R2 beeps affectionately. Leia steps outside and looks up at the field of stars. She looks up at the vastness of space. A star falls. It gives her peace. A serene, sun-dappled ranch, surrounded by rolling green fields of tall grass. Smoke curls from the chimneys. Finn sits with a circle of young kids, 6'11", in a stun-drenched cabin. A fire crackles as he finishes his story. And the light could be seen all over the galaxy in every system. Ray gave us all hope. A little girl, seven years old, looks up, confused. But how do you know she's gone? Finn looks down. I don't believe she is gone. I believe... Finn eyes Rose. Seated at a wood table, parts of a droid motivator spread out in the table in front of her. And she smiles. I believe someday she'll come back, Finn continued. And when she does, we'll all be here, waiting. The kids smile, relieved. They like that ending. Go on, get outside, he says. The kids leap up and run out into the daylight. Finn rises with them and follows the last one out. The children race around the pasture. Dade is among them. So is the broom boy from Canto Bite. They race around the Nerf foal, trying to hook a ring around its tiny horns. BB-8 races with them, beeping excitedly. The little girl hooks it. The ring flies through the air into her hand. These children are Force-sensitive. Finn and Rose had built a refuge for Force-sensitive youth to live the life that they never had. Finn steps onto the front porch leans against a post, and the twin sunset washes his face. Something in the sunset changes his wist wistful expression. Unclear at first, but it soon became a realisation. A tremor in the force. Poe and Chewie in the Falcon at light speed. They have finally followed the beacon, and it had begun to glow. Chewie roars, Poe sees it eyes wide. Chewie, turn the ship around. I know, just turn it around, he yells again as Chewbacca begins to roar. Finn notices a glimmer of light in the distance. He steps forward to get a closer look and Rose joins him, shielding her eyes from it. A figure blurs on the horizon, a familiar silhouette, dirty and ragged, walking for a long time. BB-8 rolls forward, beeps excitedly, and the kids can hear the joy. They stop their game and look to the fields beyond. On the horizon we see Ray, Ray Salona. Her eyes are restored and only a faint scar runs across her forehead. The kids run towards her, joined by BB-8, who is a bit faster. Rey walks on towards the homestead. Here, she will train a new generation of Jedi and pass down what she has learned, that only an understanding of the balance within can lead to peace and justice in the galaxy. The end.